Put your hand there. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to the July 25th meeting of the Jefferson County Board of Education. Prior to this meeting, the board held an executive session where the board conducted, conducted an executive session for the purpose of discussions relating to collective bargaining negotiations and discussions that might lead to the appointment of an individual employee. No action was taken. At this time, I'd like to ask you to join us in our traditional moment of silence. Thank you. Next up on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, we are honored to have Boy Scout Troop 195 at the back of the room, and I would like to ask them to lead us in the pledge. And gentlemen, when I point to you, please start us off. Thank you, members of Troop 195, especially for my impromptu uh, request for you to lead us in the pledge. At this time, I'd like to uh, have our vision statement read by member Chris Kolb. All Jefferson County Public School students graduate prepared, empowered, and inspired to reach their full potential and contribute as thoughtful, responsible citizens of our diverse, shared world. Thank you, Member Cole. Normally at this point, we would go launch into our recognitions and resolutions. However, there are none this particular time. Uh, and, and I do want to go ahead and start off our meeting by first welcoming our, the first meeting of our officially of our acting superintendent, Dr. Marty Polio, and also to welcome, is Carmen here? No, oh, there you are, sorry, I'm so looking, <laughs> looking in the wrong place. Dr. Carmen Coleman, who is joining us as our Chief Academic Officer, so welcome aboard, uh, and welcome to your first Jefferson County Board meeting as a member of Cabinet. So we pre appreciate you being here. Uh, at this point, we're gonna move over to our next item, which is the recommendation of approval of a meeting agenda. Are there any revisions or discussion? Member Geese. I'd like to make a motion to hear from our uh, public speakers uh, immediately following superintendent's report. So noted, just to, for everyone's information at this time, well actually, officially, we have four members that will be addressing us um, on non-agenda items, and we have one uh, speaker that will be talking about an agenda item. So more on that later. So is there a motion to, uh, are you, that motion has been made, I assume, by Member Geese. Is there a second? Second made by Member Kolb. All those in favor? Motion is unanimous. Motion carries, and we'll move that uh, speaker item to after the superintendent's report. I also need a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Motion made by Member Geese. Second made by Member Duncan. All those in favor? Motion again passes unanimously. All right, moving on to our recommendation for approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. Is there a motion to approve? And this isn't just a minutes of the previous meeting, it's meetings, and this will be for June 27th, July 10th, July 14th, and July 15th. Is there a motion? Motion made by Member Porter. Is there a second? Ma second made by Member Kolb. All those in favor? Again, motion passes unanimously. At this time, it's, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Polio for his very first superintendent's report. Okay, putting the pressure on me there. Just uh, a little. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, honored um, to be here in this seat, obviously, as my first official um, board meeting as acting superintendent, um, and excited about uh, the work that we have in front of us and also the work that's taken place over the past few weeks um, with a, a great staff um, that is working very hard and diligently to um, move forward Vision 2020. Um, I first want to take this opportunity to thank our board members and to acknowledge our board members for a board retreat that occurred two weekends ago. Um, it was very evident through two days of work and learning at Junior Achievement that there is a new spirit, 
um, at least very evident now of collaboration, uh, focus on student achievement, and a focus on moving Vision 2020 forward. Um, so walked away with uh, very inspired about what is in front of us in Jefferson County Public Schools and the things that we can do for student learning and student achievement together as board and acting superintendent. Um, I wanted to bring forward, um, as I've said many times, uh, myself and the cabinet, we've worked very hard over the past several weeks to ensure that we are focused on a few important areas that support Vision 2020 as we move forward, especially with 2017-18. And we believe that it will uh, produce the foundation that will take us to the success needed in 2020. Those three areas that we're really going to focus on this year, number one, improving climate and culture. Um, as has been noted and documented many times, as I've said, that will be uh, a, a very important focus for us this year that we improve climate and culture and we monitor that throughout the year. Secondly, increasing student learning. Um, we, we, use looting, uh, we use student learning because of we want it to encompass both deeper learning aspects and a focus on a standards-based approach to instruction, but deeper learning is critical for us. And finally, increasing or improving our organizational coherence. Those are the aspects that we'll be looking at um, throughout this entire year that you will see a new focus in board reports that every single meeting I will want to address these three areas um, and how we are improving and what we are doing to work and specifically the things in the board meeting that will be occurring that will address those three areas. Um, and so that's how we will, that I will want the superintendent's report um, during these board meetings um, so that you are aware of the things that we are doing as a collective organization in those three areas. Tonight, most of the work that uh, we focus on will be about both climate and culture and improving climate and culture and also improving and increasing our organizational coherence, which I believe is uh, a very important aspect that we have to improve in JCPS. Um, as has been well documented, first of all, when it comes to organizational coherence, I am recommending some um, org chart changes today um, that I think will help us become more efficient in our operation to increase student learning and support schools. Um, as you know, our chief business officer will remain vacated for the year. Um, we will not fill that position. Uh, as Chair Brady said, uh, our chief academic officer is uh, now being brought back into it. That's, uh, there will be some changes, as I'll note momentarily in org chart. Very excited to have Dr. Coleman joining us um, and her ability to, to move our work forward, specifically as it deals with uh, student learning, but also with culture and climate. It's important to know that we're uh, tr striving to see coherence in all of our departments, including schools. When it comes to central office, we want to have a person who is accountable for the success of that organization, um, for the outcomes that involve the three areas that I said earlier. Um, and that person is ultimately responsible for the success of that area or that division, and they report to me. So we are making org, org chart changes that reflect that. You will see in our org chart changes that all of our behavior initiatives will now be under area five. Um, we want to make sure that schools are very clear um, about our initiatives and behavior, um, that um, we have one person that answers to the uh, behavior initiatives, to the data, to what we are expecting to see in schools, high expectations, with also very high support in students, and also ensuring, as I've said in prior meetings, that not only the high expectations, but we have plans to address um, in every single school um, our uh, data numbers when it comes to behavior. Also with this now, our ECE department under academic services can do better in making sure that um, they have a laser-like focus on improving instruction and support when it comes to ECE services. We think that will move us forward. Our assistant superintendents, our, our area superintendents, excuse me, will now report back to our chief academic officer as it was a couple of years ago. We believe that uh, Dr. Coleman will, will ensure that we are aligned across all six areas um, and that, as I said before, culture and climate and student learning um, is moving forward, improving, and occurring in all of our schools within all of our achievement areas. So I'm excited to bring that to you. Also, as I've said before, um, we want to work to use some of the funds that we're not using to better support schools, give teachers and employees the tools they need to be successful, which I think is a very important component 
um, to culture and climate and morale, that people have the tools they need to be successful. Being completely candid, I think we've moved away from that a little bit in um, prior years and we need to make sure that that happens. We're going to start with added resources to schools. Some things will be minor, some things will be major. For a school, something like uh, having every copy machine working in a school um, is very critical and major. It might seem like it's not a, a huge aspect in a venue like this, but it's critical to schools that they have those supplies to be successful. Um, we have a plan in place uh, approving a um, budget request for $150,000 so that we can make sure on the first day of school copy machines are working in every single building and that we are responsive to the needs of schools. We're also working to make sure that teachers have the opportunity to get to us requests that they need to be successful. Schools have that, that if, if they don't have the needs that they, now there's a difference between wants and needs and we want to make sure that, that we uh, make that clear. But if teachers, if schools need something to, to be successful, we want to be able to provide that for them. We're going to continue to bring those changes to make sure that schools and teachers have what they need to be successful. Tonight you'll also receive three reports in three different areas. You'll, see, you'll hear a report on progress at uh, Stewart and Frost Middle School, um, ESL Newcomer Academy, and HR. Um, in each of these areas, it's been important to me that we just not present successes or things that are going well, but also areas for growth and improvement so that we're very honest and open about the things that need to happen to continue to move forward. So you will hear those tonight and have the opportunity to ask questions. A um, couple of other areas that I'd like to bring forward on tonight, it's been uh, widely questioned whether we are having showcase of schools this year. Uh, you can see that there is an agreement put forth tonight uh, with the fairgrounds that we will have showcase of schools Saturday, October 28th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. so that we give our community and our parents the opportunity to make decisions about showcase of schools. I want to highlight a couple other areas. Uh, Atherton High School, approval of their site-based council to allow two students to be on their council. They are non-voting members. Um, they've been on this, but this is something that the state has alerted us that we have to make sure that is approved through the alternate SBDM process. Uh, but I want to commend Atherton for giving student voice um, to uh, the student body in their governing body so that uh, we acknowledge that student belonging is such an important part of engagement and having students actively involved in, in uh, government at the school level is so important. So uh, I want to commend Atherton for taking that step. Also tonight you will receive from our EQUOC committee, which is a 50-50 committee between JCPS and JCTA, our collaboration between the two organizations to uh, submit our certified evaluation plan, which is the plan required by the state to, to tell us how we will certify our teachers and our administrators. Um, and I believe that this collaboration between the two organizations was very effective. Uh, focused on improving teaching and learning um, and leadership in our schools. So I want to commend the EQUOC committee and those that worked on that to make sure that we had a successful CEP plan or certified evaluation plan. Um, one other thing to note that as we move forward um, at the August 8th meeting, we will be focusing in on priorities um, and budget priorities. We're closely monitoring right now a discussion at the, at the state about increased local contributions to our retirement system, CERS. Um, as we move forward, we're really going to have to take into account projections about our estimated increase in cost or funding to CERS. Um, there has been some discussion that that could be as much as $13 million um, for the 18-19 budget. Um, that will obviously have a direct impact on the decisions that we make um, and the support that we provide to all of our schools and students. So we're going to have to monitor that closely and make sure that uh, we have the ability to make the appropriate decisions for that. Finally, I would like to report that our first day task force is working diligently to get ready for the first day of school. Um, I recognize and I think the committee recognizes that a smooth first day is critical to the success of our school year, but I also want to note that day two through day 175 are just as important. So we've got to make sure that yes, day one 
Um, we have a very successful day one, but also every other day after that is focused on culture climate, student learning, um, and organizational coherence. So we're deeply committed to those principles. We're going to make sure that we do that and continue to work hard every day to ensure that those three things happen in JCPS. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Polio. At this time, our next item on our agenda would be action items. We don't have any this particular meeting, so therefore we're going to move on to informational items. Actually, before I do that, let me talk about the amended agenda, where we're going to be bringing forth our speakers. Uh, our first speaker, as I said, there are four of them. Our first speaker will be Michael Biggers, and he's going to be discussing, discussing the Cur Education Career Academy. So if Mr. Biggers can come on down. While you're pre uh, making your way to the desk down here to address the board, let me go over our rules regarding speakers. In accordance with board policy 01.421, the board expects that persons who have signed up to address the board will limit their remarks to the subject that they list at the time they have signed up, that their presentation will not include any defamatory or abusive remarks about the subject, and that they will present their remarks in a manner that is consistent with the orderly conduct by the board of its business. Informal, you can have a seat if you like, if you don't feel it. Uh, informal ha handouts may be given to the board secretary for distribution in accordance with policy. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. At the end of two and a half minutes, a bell will sound once. You will then have 30 seconds to finish your statement. At the end of three minutes, the bell will sound twice, indicating that your time is up. The superintendent will look into the speaker's issues if necessary and represent the board in any follow-up uh, conversations or recommended action to the board. Uh, also, in accordance with the board policy of 01.421, the board reserves the right to limit, extend, or terminate any speaker's presentation if the speaker's remarks are not consistent with the requirements of the board policy. So, with that in mind, Mr. Biggers, you can start, and the floor is yours at any time you wish to Great. proceed. Thank you. That's the bell. Students, come in. Uh, excuse me. Can you please speak into the microphone? I'm sorry to, uh, I'm sorry to and address your comments to the board. Um, the reason I say that is because these proceedings are being recorded and we want to make sure that that information is captured. That's the bell. Come in. Take your seats. Pull out your opener sheets. Begin your opener. Write down your learning target. Teachers in this room and board members, we know that this is how most of our teachers start their classes. I have been in the Education Career Academy for three years. This will be my fourth year in the Education Career Academy. I'm excited to say that this program is excelling and it has, it has made me want to be an educator. This program has taught me that this, uh, when, when, when you come in classroom, writing down the learning target and doing the bell work, it is a great way to get your students, get their minds going, but it's time for us to reimagine education. And that is what we have learned in the Education Career Academy, to reimagine it. It's time for us to get students excited about education. And this program has got me excited about education and educators. You do not understand how excited I am to get out of high school, out of JCPS, into college, to come back and teach as an educator in JCPS. I'm excited. I participated in the Educators Rising Conference um, in June on the 24th in Phoenix, Arizona. I won second place in lesson planning and delivery for JCPS. During uh, the conference, we had breakout sessions. During one of the breakout sessions, the presenters did not show up. So the students of Seneca High School, me, we, there was two that they did not show up in, but me, I stood up and I said, as an educator, you have to be willing to step up when it's needed. So that's what I did. I stepped up, I stepped up, and I ran that breakout session in front of 30 students by myself, <laughs> like we should do as educators. I'm excited, and we thank you, JCPS, for having this career, um, for having this ac the academy at Seneca, and now, as I've heard, it's going to be at all other schools in JCPS, and I'm so excited about that to have. So you're giving the opportunity for us to come back and work for JCPS as future educators. I am so excited. And it's, it's just, I don't know, it's just overwhelming how excited I am about education and about being an educator. I cannot wait to get in classrooms to teach and to, to get students excited about learning, to have those relationships, to have students come in and say, I want to go to school because I know that Mr. Michael Biggers is there and he has something planned for us today. <laughs> 
And of course, we will have to sometimes do PowerPoints. We'll have to sometimes take notes. But every day, there will be a reason they're going to want to come to my classroom. And they're going to be excited about education. I thank you, JCPS, and I thank Seneca High School for having this academy and letting us become future educators. And I, I've been wanting to say this forever, but I am JCPS. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Biggers. Again, thank you, Mr. Biggers. Uh, next up will be Jeremiah Potter. And we'll be speaking about the importance of art and music education in school. Mr. Potter. No, I'm okay. I'm going to set it down when I play. Uh, hello, my name is Jeremiah Potter. I'm a student at DuPont Manual High School and the Youth Performing Arts School. And along with my school band, I perform with the Dynasax Classical Quartet and the Spur of the Moment Jazz Quintet. And I'm here tonight to talk about the importance of arts in our schools and your support with it. <coughs> so the arts and music to me is a really unique experience that teaches focus and hard work and courage and cooperation and it's something that offers a unique blend of conventions and camps and competitions and friendships that we can take throughout our lives it's something that schools there's not much else like it that schools can offer and to show you how important it is to us and how important it how important it is that you continue to invest in it i'd like to play a short excerpt from a piece that I'm performing in several competitions soon. Thank you, Mr. Potter. Next up will be Sarah Choate to discuss sex education. I'll sit. Uh, thank you, Superintendent Folio, um, Chairman Brady, and esteemed members of the school board. I appreciate your allowing. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm on. Just pull the microphone oh, I'm closer. Sorry. Thanks. I don't sorry. usually use a mic. Thanks. Um, I appreciate your allowing me the opportunity to speak with you tonight. 
Um, my name is Sarah Choate. Uh, as many of you know from our meeting last year, uh, I'm a sexuality educator. I am also a doctoral student in public health at U of L and a former public school teacher. I'm here to discuss the merits of the comprehensive sex ed guidelines of which this board is familiar. A couple of years ago, I was invited to offer a healthy relationship workshop for a girls empowerment conference uh, where I was attended by about 1,000 high school uh, students from all over the city. In the first session, I presented to 150 girls, and at the end, I asked them off the cuff, how many of you have known someone whose romantic partner constantly texted them or tried to control who they hung out with uh, or where they went? And over 75% of the girls raised their hands in that room. So I also asked off the cuff, how many of you have been personally in a romantic relationship where your partners did this on a regular basis? and around 50% raised their hands. I had, um, this is a 20 minute healthy relationship kind of fast thing that we were doing and I had two more sessions of 150 girls. So I said, heck, I'm gonna ask them too. Same responses, 75%, 50%. You um, know, over 200 of those high school girls had experienced at least one serious marker of an abusive relationship. And this was, you know, not representative necessarily or, um, you know, uh, research, but uh, it was startling and extremely concerning. I wanted to share this story with you because it offers a glimpse of what our youth, as you well know, are up against. And they are and will continue to face real life challenges uh, throughout their youth and through their adult years um, that have serious consequences, consequences that can interrupt or even derail their academic pursuits, which is the ultimate goal of um, this board is to make sure that they, they make it through. Uh, that is unless schools are empowered to offer learning opportunities that include such valuable health education lessons on say how to spot red flags in an unhealthy relationship or role playing how to give and receive consent. Any good sex educator would attest it is crucial we value everyone's beliefs, their attitudes, their feelings, their opinions uh, about sexuality and the few strong voices opposing the guidelines have every right to opt their own child or children out which the guidelines firmly support, as you well know. However, these same folks do not have the right to opt everyone else's child out using whatever tactic works best. So the argument has been made that the guidelines disempower SBDMs from making curricula choices. This is false. As you well know, SBDMs have the final say on curricula choices for their school, and the guidelines of which you have a copy of do not mention specific curriculum and could never take that power away from SBDMs. I, along with community members, concerned JCPS teachers, parents, students, and community, implore you to put the comprehensive sex ed guidelines on the agenda so they can be properly voted on. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Choate. <laughs> Next up is Meghana Kudramati, also speaking about sex education. Hello, my name is Megan Okudrimodi, and I'm a fellow with Louisville Sex Education now. Uh, when I was younger, I went to Jefferson County Public Schools, but now I live in Lexington, Kentucky, where I study biology at the University of Kentucky. I'm pre-med, and I hope to become a gynecologist one day. This summer, I've been working with LISTEN to pass comprehensive sex education guidelines so that all students in Jefferson County can have access to age-appropriate, medically accurate sex education. The guidelines we want to pass address not only the benefits of delaying sexual activity and STD pregnancy and HIV prevention, but they also focus on how to form healthy relationships, what consent looks like, and how to reach out to your parents or other trusted members of your community to have meaningful discussions about sex, like Sarah said. Throughout my time working on this campaign, I have met numerous people that have been negatively impacted by the lack of sexual education in Jefferson County. One story in particular that resonates with me is the story of a victim of child marriage. Although it is difficult to imagine that in this time at, in the United States there's child marriage, at the age of 14 this woman did not even realize that she was being preyed on by a man who was almost twice her age. She told me that had she known about consent and the characteristics of a healthy relationship, she would have been less vulnerable to becoming a child bride. Sex education could have saved her. Over the next few weeks, we will lift up all of our supporters, but tonight, we wanted to address all the letters we have received in support of comprehensive sex education, specifically in District 3. Please read over the 60 letters. 
And know that in the last two weeks, we have signed up over 800 new supporters, including 29 local businesses, churches, and organizations, all in support of sex ed. It has been so rewarding to see the overwhelming support for comprehensive sexual education in Jefferson County. I come from a conservative Indian household. The opposition, the opposition say, says that sex is a conversation to have in the home, but growing up, sex was not something that I could talk to my parents about. Looking back, I think that if I had a solid, unbiased, academic understanding of sex education, it would have better prepared me for the relationships I would have later on in life. Please vote yes for comprehensive sex education. If you haven't met with us yet, Louisville Sex Education Now, we are always available to meet with you guys and we would love to, to meet with every single one of you. We have concerns and all we wanna do is discuss them with you. Thank you and thanks for letting me speak and have a good night. Thank you. <laughs> that concludes our public speakers on non-agenda items. As I mentioned before, next normally we would go to action items. We don't have any. However, we do have some information items, of which there are three, and the superintendent had, uh, spoke about those three items in just a little bit ago. However, we do have one speaker regarding an agenda item. Uh, this will be regarding the ESL Newcomer Academy, and Grace Lee, or Gracie Lee, if you are here. Gracie Lee once, Gracie Lee twice. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, come on up and uh, you can address. Uh, the same rules apply for this. Uh, if you want to come up and uh, address the uh, board, you still have three minutes. At two and a half minutes, you'll hear a bell at, uh, signifying you have 30 seconds to wrap up your comments. And at the end of three minutes, you'll hear two bells. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't prepare. <laughs> uh, where's the you don't have to speak if you don't wish to do yeah. so. I said it's up to you. Oh, okay. Okay. I think uh, our. ESL newcomer <laughs> school is very great. Mrs. Snow, my, our principal, did a good job. Uh, we have uh, so much students in there. We have a different language. We are academic levels different. So one teacher, I'm the support math program. So I just know some students didn't even go to school from Africa. Some students uh, can speak English. It's uh, very hard for teacher to teach them. But we hold them together. Uh, we try hard. Everybody try hard. Try to slow down. Try to be patient. So I think uh, we did a good job. We, we probably need uh, one building, I guess. <laughs> we just have a different place. We just uh, let them um, think about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> that, con <laughs> that concludes our speakers uh, for this evening. Now we'll move on to the first of our information items. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Polio to introduce the first of the action of these information items regarding the ESL Newcomer Academy. Dr. Polio. Thank you, Chair Brady. Um, honored to bring up to the table a very hardworking group of educators who are going to report to us on progress um, and areas for improvement on our ESL Newcomer Academy. Greetings. Greetings, thank you for um, having us here. We're eager to share about our school, the ESL Newcomer Academy. I'm Gwen Snow, I'm the principal of the ESL Newcomer Academy. This is Sherry Duff, she is our assistant principal. And I'm really honored and humbled by the staff that have showed up tonight. Um, I was kind of surprised actually, and it means a lot, um, especially for our students. I think it shows how much they really do care. So um, thank you guys for showing up. Um, I'm gonna start out. Um, just sharing a little bit about our school. We also have some information you have in your packets that you, you've been prepared with. I'm adjusting here to the microphone and my notes. Um, yeah. So we began um, in 2007 at Shawnee High School. Um, we maximized our district resources in one facility at that point. That was the goal then. And we wanted to provide specially trained ESL content teachers for all of our students. So the instruction for the entire day, 740 to 220 every day, 
students were understanding instruction. They had teachers that were trained in their content area, algebra, science, social studies, and they were ESL endorsed as well. Um, and that still holds true to this day. Um, we also, by having that one resource beginning back in 2007, the staff could collaborate easily. They could focus on sheltered instruction, um, get together content areas, share resources, uh, not only instructional resources, manipulatives, textbooks, new, new concepts as well. And it also helped us to interact with the community and stakeholders more easily. You can imagine, if, I don't know if anybody's been to another country, but um, there's a lot going on and trying to adapt to that. And if you have a few places that you really get to know well, you're going to be able to use those much better. So. so what we do on a regular basis, um, make sure I keep up with my notes, is we teach English to beginners. That's using, there's um, an assessment that they use in the ESL intake office. Students score below, they pretty much at a beginning level of English or lower. Um, they're grades 6 through 10, and they can be anywhere from age 11 up through, we've had students age out up to 21. Students acclimate to the new school and a new culture. Once again, school is different wherever you go across the country or across the world. Um, so you can, you know, it's just very different when you come in to us. Um, we also teach grade level content in an accessible manner. So there's no time for students basically to learn English and then go into Algebra 1 or Chemistry. We're doing it all at the same time. And it's pretty amazing if, if a few of you have had a chance to come and visit, how that they can keep up. I know Ms. Warren had um, a chance to actually shadow a student one day, um, which was, I know it the student loved it. She had a great time. <laughs> okay, good, good. Um, um, so we also provide extra literacy and numeracy support for students with a limited education background. About, it depends on who's coming in, um, but about 20 to 25 percent of our students will have, as Ms. Lee was saying, an, an interrupted education. Some students have never had the chance at all to go to school. Some have had an excellent background. So we have a very diverse um, student population. But about 20% of our instruction also has to help bolster those skills. If a student never had the chance to read or write in a, in a language, this will help them out. Oh. Also, in your packets, too, I just wanted to refer. I had some supplemental materials as well. We have um, our vision and mission, and there's some extra information as well about our program and growth over the past couple of years. So you can refer to that. Um, also, we have social and emotional supports for our students. Once again, if you consider what they're going through, the trauma of just, I mean, it's a big deal. I was talking to a young man, he's an American student. He moved from one neighborhood to another neighborhood and is changing some of his family members. That's a big deal for a teenager. Our students are also learning a new language, adapting to a new culture. Um, their families are pretty stressed out as well. They're adapting to new things. So a lot of times, you know, our staff are able to help. All our bilingual associate instructors have extra um, mental health first aid training. We have two counselors to help us out as well, plus um, a mental health counselor um, to help students as they're adapting through all of those needs. Um, Sherry's my reminder. Okay. Um, and then also one big thing that, um, third from the last bullet, we help offset newcomer influx in the district. Students will transition from us at the end of the year. They will um, go on to new schools the following year, which is a much easier transition for them. They're starting new with everyone else. So we grow over the course of the year. And you'll notice also in that packet, the supplemental ma materials you saw over the last, I think, three years, our growth rate. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on that in a second. Um, but that helps not only um, our students, but also the schools that our students go to. A lot of those schools are priority schools, and there's a list of those as well in that packet. Um, so you don't have a student starting in February and November. They all start at a consistent time, and they can focus on their needs at one time with everyone else. Um, and then, of course, we also help our students transition to regular schools and prepare for college and career. And we have also started a talent academy pathway focusing on computer literacy. We're really excited. We just added two new teachers for that. Um, they were computer engineer professors in Venezuela, so it's going to be pretty cool. Um, so how do we do what we do? Our teachers are all certified in their content area. They have an ESL endorsement as well. Um, they use research-based strategies for English language development. Uh, we especially focus on um, um, items through the Center for Applied Linguistics. 
We have a very diverse staff. Over 50% of our teaching staff have some sort of international background. They're, they're from another country. So they understand completely what our students are going through. They also add a very strong dynamic to our professional learning communities, all these different instructional backgrounds. You can imagine um, some very interesting conversations as how, how we approach um, instructing our students. We also have bilingual associate instructors that help our students adapt to the day. They're pretty much spread out though. The instruction that we do is all in English, but the BAIs um, help with family connections. It helps students adapt, especially on those first few days. Um, or once again, they have that mental health um, training as well, that first aid. So if a student is stressed out, they can help them. And of course, we have a mental health counselor um, who is a huge support. There are some of our students who have very limited access to mental health, or maybe it's just something new to them culturally, so helping them understand that there are services out there that can help them adjust, and their families, a homeschool coordinator, a college access resource teacher. We started our Talent Academy Pathway course. We have Goal Clarity Coach, um, Positive Climate to welcome students. It's very much a focus as far as being a newcomer academy. Um, and we have life skills and advocacy courses to help them to understand, once again, this new culture and to celebrate their own heritages. I don't know if any of you, of you have had a chance to come to our global homecoming, but that kind of comes through those classes as well, so they can study about themselves and share about their cultures. Um, so how do we do what we do? Um, we also use community support. Um, Kentucky Refugee Ministries, Catholic Charities have great liaisons to help us connect with families and their programs. The YMCA Newcomer Program is funded through the Downtown YMCA. We have a director, Katrina Moore, um, who runs that program and helps to do extracurriculars with our students, um, especially soccer, character development, um, and helping connect with um, Kentucky Youth Advocates, a few other things like that. Um, local universities, lots of field work with education programs, um, and um, also just other local organizations in general, some volunteer community groups. Um, JCPS Health Services also helps us out with immunizations on site and physical clinics on site. Once again, going back to if you're new to a community and you're not sure where to go, you do know where a few things are, like for example, your school, um, maybe the grocery street, you know, grocery store down the street, those kinds of things. So having those things accessible um, definitely help our parents and families connect to their community. Um, we also have academic support services through the JCPS ESL department. They have instructional coaches that help support us um, in our different sites. And um, just routine communication with our parents, once again, using our BAIs to help us make phone calls and keep um, parents updated on what's going on. Um, how we've changed over the last year, this is just last year. So on August 12th, on the third day of school, we had 434 newcomer students. Over the course of the year, we enrolled an additional 474 students, and then we ended up the year with 908 students. To accommodate that growth, we hired an additional 12 teachers. It was, I think we got the funding in October, um, and, and HR was a big help. We were able to add 12 more teachers that were ESL endorsed and in their subject area over the course, you know, in the middle of the year three bilingual associate instructors as well, so we increased our staff by 33%. In January, we added additional classrooms at Phoenix. Also, another month later, we added more classrooms at Gaines, um, and trying to keep movement um, as minimal as possible. Now, our plans for this year, we'll start with about the same enrollment. I've counted, we have about 430 students so far. We have three more weeks of enrollments. So it should be pretty consistent with last year's beginning enrollment. Our building assignments, um, we, since we had a little time over the summer to readjust, we're not just kind of adding rooms where there's space. Um, we have shifted our sixth grade and our middle, our, and our middle school SIFE students, those are students with a significant interruption of formal education at our middle school level. They will be at the Gaines building. Our seventh and eighth graders will be at the Phoenix building and our high school will be all together in one spot at Shawnee, um, which will help share resources once again between s teachers a little bit better. Uh, s our support staff um, has been relocated in order to address the needs of our entire school. Um, so our secretary and order receiving will be at Shawnee. We'll have attendance and records at Gaines, additional clerk and staff over at Phoenix, um, our AP at Phoenix, two counselors, one assistant principal, and one principal for all three buildings. And we do not have a youth service center or a social work assigned 
assigned to us. We do have additional resources at our Phoenix location. They'll have extracurricular and um, sports for seventh and eighth grade students with the support of the YMCA. Um, they have additional field and gym space there, which makes that work out really well. Um, we also have a library collection at our Shawnee space. Um, and with the assistance of the librarian at Shawnee, we will be able to provide library opportunities for our students. And middle school students will have field trips to the public library throughout the year. We did get an um, activity bus this year, which is a big help, so we'll be able to, to do that. Um, and then our, just to give you some demographics, our top five languages, we had 490 Spanish speakers at the end of the year, 91 Arabic, you can kind of read through the list, um, but those were our, our major languages. It's very diverse. Um, and at the buildings, we had 257 at Phoenix and 522 at Shawnee and 130 at Gaines. Um, about 20% of our population last year were interrupted education and 100% um, of course are limited education, uh, limited English proficient. Um, a little over 50% were categorized as homeless and about 90% free and reduced lunch. Oh, my time's up. Okay, there's more information about how we transition students there too, so. Um, Thank you for that information. I did want to add a, uh, a couple of things that I think are very important. First of all, I want to commend um, Ms. Snow, the principal for leadership. Um, and the teachers that are here, do we have any teachers from Newcomer? Thank you for being here tonight. <laughs> so I always say when um, we have to look at, and I tell some other teachers that if you want to see how difficult it can be to differentiate instruction in a classroom, go into an ESL classroom, um, especially Newcomer, where several languages can be spoken, varying degrees of reading abilities, that they come with. Um, so commend you on your efforts. Excellent um, work out of our um, ESL teachers. And they really model in many ways. Um, and I've had the great opportunity to work with a lot of ESL students and teachers over 10 years. They model a great way to communicate with families. Um, and I've noticed that out of ESL. A couple of things that we definitely need to improve on. Um, for 2018-19, this needs to be the last school year where our ESL um, services are divided amongst three facilities. Um, so that is at the very top of our facilities plan um, will be to make the necessary changes with facilities. Um, so I'll go on record to say that 2018-19 um, uh, we will have one facility for ESL newcomer that will give the opportunity for growth too so that we won't be the same spot 12 months later where we are looking for um, additional spots that are not in the same location. So that has to be the top of our facilities list with a few others, uh, but we will be working on that to support those. Also, um, uh, talking with Principal Snow, we talked uh, at this point, we wanna talk about the possibility of looking at um, an additional administrator for the coming year because we do have a facility, I believe, right now that does not have an administrator. Um, how many students did you say were at Gaines right now, or uh, planned? Planned, we'll, we'll be able to hold about 150. So we'll work to support that and see okay. what we can do to help you with that um, as soon as possible. Um, but definitely, we uh, appreciate the commitment to being in different locations for this year, but 18, 19, we're gonna work hard to make sure you have one location. Thank you. All right, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Polio. Are there any questions? Member Geese. Yes, I have a, a question and a little bit of background um, about myself as well. Um, as a student studying education at Bellarmine University, and I believe about 2011, I had the opportunity to work at Newcomer Academy. That's okay. Oh, uh, was so you right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I remember being in the classroom with Miss Susan B. Blally. I don't yeah. know if she is still there. Uh, but it's an absolutely transformative program, um, something that I took a, a great delight in as a student at Bellarmine, having the opportunity to do a little bit of my student teaching work at Newcomer. I okay. um, also see Scott Wade in the audience, who's a teacher of mine at Atherton. Um, but aside from that, uh, aside from that little bit of, of background, um, I applaud Dr. Polio in saying that ESL will have a, uh, a standalone facility 
but something that also struck me on there is uh, why no youth service coordinator? Why no youth service center? It seems almost as if this particular demographic would most benefit from that, and yet they do not have one. And so I'm just curious about that, and if there's anything we can do moving forward to ensure that when they do get a new facility past 2019, uh, that we get a youth service center in there, or perhaps one a little earlier. Yeah. I can't answer as to why I guess that has or has not happened at the time, um, but I can say we will work to, to see what we can do to support that. Thank you. Further questions? Member Porter. Thank you. No, you're on now. Okay. Thank you for being here tonight, and if you've not seen the ESL Newcomer Academy, is something that you must see because it's uh, education at the highest level. And the, uh, the dynamics are completely different. Um, I think it was last year or maybe two years ago I had an opportunity to attend um, a meeting over at the Gaines Academy and we had a lot of uh, ESL parents there. And it was amazing to me that they were reluctant to talk to school board members. But once they found out that we talked and we talked back, <laughs> It was a great day, so, um, and I think that as we talk about culture and climate for our students, that they have to feel comfortable as well as their parents have to feel comfortable. So I commend you for all that you do every day for our students. And I realize that when they come to us, that they have sometimes come from not the best of circumstances, and there are things for them to be anxious about. And I appreciate all that you all are doing every day. I don't really have any questions, but I just wanted to, I think sometimes you just have to stop and say, job well done and you all are doing a fantastic job and everyone everybody's doing a fantastic job so take this hand and put it over here and pat yourself on the back because we appreciate all that you're doing um i do want us to notice the fact that in the course of the year you grow and in many situations we have school a normal school where you have the same students that start day one and end the last day of school. So that is a um, instructional challenge, but you are meeting the challenge and I thank um, our staff for making sure that you got 12 extra teachers because that's extremely important that you have the staff to manage everything. The one thing that I didn't hear you say that um, I will say, this is a public service announcement, on August the 3rd at the ESL Newcomer Academy, at the Shawnee campus, there is a huge health fair. So everyone's invited to attend, and you can't miss it because it takes up the whole street. So once you get on market, that's August the 3rd, it's a health fair, and Gwen, if you could quickly tell us the collaboration that you have yeah. with other groups so that we will know who helped to make this possible. Yes. And that's all I have to say, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Porter. Um, the Northwest Neighborhood Place and Kentucky One collaborate with us, and they do a great job. It's pretty awesome. And they have Dare to Care. They have um, Clothes Closet. They have all sorts of things going on there. So it's a wonderful opportunity. And it's not just for our parents. It's for the whole neighborhood. It's designed for that. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, member, our uh, Vice Chair Wilner is next, and then Member Duncan. Thank you so much. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the work that you guys do in the school every day. And I just uh, want to, I guess, add my appreciation to Ms. Porter's. It's amazing uh, the work that takes place. And, um, you know, I, I just think for students who have come from all kinds of circumstances and all kinds of challenges and to find themselves delivered into your capable hands, what an amazing gift and an amazing opportunity. So it's actually very moving to visit the school and uh, encourage people who have not had that opportunity to, to find time to do that. Um, I, I, I want to thank Dr. Polio for um, his commitment to putting this at the top of the facilities list. It is so vitally important that you're able to concentrate your resources for the good of our fastest growing population uh, in the school district. Um, and I want to just ask I guess related to that, and as we begin to think about funding priorities for 2018-19, not only the facilities issue, but I noticed in your materials that you provided in advance, you used to be staffed for end of year needs so that you were not having to scramble all year long to fill vacancies, or not even vacancies, to, to just meet the needs. And I wonder if that would be something that will be on our 
priority list to consider is to be able to staff for the expected population, not just the population right. at the beginning of the year. Yeah, I think we can definitely look at that. I mean, th there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to look at trend data um, and staff. Now, those positions, if the students aren't there on August 16, day one or day five, we wouldn't necessarily be able to fill those positions. I mean, we could, depending on the situation with HR, whether we have that personnel available. But um, I, I think we could find a way to look to progressively um, fund the school so that they have the positions necessary and they're not scrambling in the middle of the year. Member Duncan? Well, I think I'm on here, yes. Um, of course, I'm, <coughs> I'm in awe of the work that you do, I mean, and I, my familiarity is with it is through Iroquois High School. Mm -hmm. And when I make visits at Iroquois and I'm able to go into the, to the section, I think we have uh, 500, nearly 500 students in that section. It's so amazing to go into such a quiet learning zone, uh, such, a, such a unique environment there with the students and all of those students working from different cr countries and different languages and backgrounds and, and all I I working together within those classrooms. Um, it's, it's an amazing accomplishment for everybody. And, you know, um, one of the things that I I've been curious about, and you said you've added staff, but when you look at your class sizes, are your class sizes in the area, uh, is that something that you would love to have reduced? Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're like, these I mean people the are amazing back here. They've been ha you know, running classrooms with like 35, 36 newcomer students when we reach certain peaks and then you know, trying to, as we add staff, we can reduce it temporarily and then we just, uh, the last couple of years especially has grown very fast. Well, so. I noticed that when I, I just toured some of the rooms, I just thought, wow, all of these students in here. And do you uh, have individual learning plans for those students? Or uh, are they, I mean, is, do we operate with ESL that way? Or, or <coughs> do we just take everybody as they are and try and move them uh, forward without the plan? Well, all students have, um, all ESL students have um, a program service plan, and it's a, a federal requirement, actually. So within the first 30 days of instruction or enrollment, um, for that's for each school year, a student will have an updated plan that shows instructional accommodations, assessment accommodations, um, what type of learning environment, and that's anybody in kindergarten, in our program, you know, transitioned out into a regular school. Um, they will all have that as long as they're getting, you know, ESL services. Yeah, one of the things I've noticed in our elementary schools, especially too, is uh, when a student becomes proficient or reaches a certain level and is declared proficient, it seems like sometimes the support goes away. And do you find that that is a challenge for you all, that you, you don't have the resources that you need to continue to support the, s the ESL students? Because uh, th they might cross that border where they're, they are proficient uh, or, or, or bordering on that, but then that doesn't necessarily mean they don't need anything else. But do you run into those kinds of uh, situations where you need more resources and you're not able to get them? Um, well, I probably, I should call, I think Eli's here too. Because he, <laughs> he can answer more for as students transition out. I, I deal mainly with our programming. I do know when they do transition out, they get um, an ESL language arts class and some other extra supports as well. Um, but I know Eli can answer a lot more about students who've moved along further. Hi, my name is Eli Beards. I'm the ESL coordinator for the district. Um, so one thing that is, is changing as we look at accountability and also with um, students moving from uh, what we used to call EL, excuse me, LEP status, now we use it English language uh, or English learner. We can, um, before we could monitor students for one to two years, they kind of exit and move into a monitored status. Um, there's some national conversation and then KDE is also now looking at 
being able to monitor students for up to four years. So some of that data is available in Infinite Campus. Um, where we get challenged, um, especially like you said at the elementary level, for example, is um, we may have some schools that have 150 to 180 English learners, and then they exit maybe 20 to 30 or 40 more students, but they're still carrying kind of a caseload of that 150, 160, uh, split between possibly three teachers. Um, so we are trying to put in some programming to help better serve students because we don't want students to exit kind of prematurely, but yet still need some support. Right. I, it, I just hope that we are s closely attuned to your needs and that you express them often because sometimes uh, people will make do with what they have, but uh, that is uh, an area that we just have to come through with support on and providing more people as much as possible to uh, continue the, the work that you're doing with, uh, with the students. But uh, I, I just, I, I don't have a lot of questions, but I'm telling you, it is, a, is an awesome program. And I, I thank you all for that work and, and all of the staff that came with you tonight. Appreciate so much. Uh, the work that you do too. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay. I don't have any uh, further questions. Thank you again for the important and critical work that you do uh, to you and your team that are here this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. So we're going to move on to our next information item. Our next information item will be an update regarding Frost and slash Stewart Middle School and its redesign. Uh, at this point, I'll turn it over to Dr. Polio to introduce this item. Thank you, Chair Brady. At this time, I'd like to bring up the team from our uh, middle school redesign initiative at the Stewart campus. Um, an update on progress after year one and plans for the future. So I will turn it over to the team. Good evening. We really appreciate this opportunity to share an update on the middle school redesign plan, and we thank you for supporting the initial proposal. As you know, this was approved by the board in March of 2016, and we appreciate being able to showcase the work of both schools. The implementation of the middle school design for Frost Sixth Grade Academy, Stewart Middle, and Valley Prep was in response to a combination of issues, both instructional and structural, that impeded long-term and sustained instructional improvement. The former Foss Building and Stewart Middle were both operating far under capacity. Logistical components of this plan included the relocation of Foss to the Stewart campus and phasing out Valley Prep. You can see that these are some of the things that were implemented and we consider successes for the year. But in addition, it's important to remember that we have an existing school with an experienced principal operating on one side of the building and a newly configured school with a first year principal, now second on the other side of the campus. The work looks different based on the needs of the teachers, the students, and the administrators. We're also at different places in the two schools in terms of systems work. Whereas Frost had to expand their systems to accommodate a larger population, Stewart had to be create all of theirs had to be created with new leaders, new teachers, and students, and occupancy on one side of the building. However, both schools have remained focused on the implementation of the four design pillar plan. Both of our principals will have an opportunity to discuss each of these with reference to their schools. As we move forward, it's important to share one of our primary concerns, though. It is for student enrollment to rem remain within the parameters shared when the proposal was approved. Otherwise, each school will struggle to utilize space and be able to support student needs. Um, before I move on to the next people, I do want to also commend the, compa or the passion, the commitment, the focus of the leaders in the buildings and to um, ensure that this plan was implemented. Our project manager will speak to deliverables and next steps for the campus a little later. Uh, we now want to allow each principal to discuss for you briefly how they have implemented the four pillars within their schools. Good evening, board. My name is Faith Stout. I'm the principal of the Robert Frost Sixth Grade Academy, where in partnership with the community, the Robert Frost Sixth Grade Academy empowers scholars to be 21st century leaders who soar to new heights. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I know you've already presented with information ahead of time, but um, I just wanted to remind you that last school year my enrollment was 434 scholars, 45% African American, 40 41% white, 9% Hispanic, 5% other. We're 82% free and reduced lunch, 17% ECE. Um, going through the change, I want to commend my staff for 
assisting with the move physically and literally. Um, we went from having approximately 170 kids to the two 434, and, and that presented different challenges. But we did have success, and anecdotally, I want to share um, a, a part of the success is the change in the tenor and the belief about the school and the community and the pride that's developing. Um, just this week, I had a parent who is um, re revoking her kid's application to uh, a magnet program in the district because she's heard great things about our school and she wants her child to remain in the resides area. And that's where that lends to what Dr. Harston uh, discussed about as our reputation improves, and because we are a great school, Stewart is a great school, that's going to bring about more community pride and increased enrollment. And so that is something to look, look for in the future. Um, our year one successes, we were able to continue with our work with implementing our Google one-to-one -one, um, program and providing technology implementation on a daily basis with kids. We put in place the foundation of our PBIS program. I'm very grateful to the board for funding our um, extended resources for mental health and behavior um, with our scholars, knowing their need. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that this year we was able to kind of stabilize um, as, as well as grow our staff. And I feel like we're on the, on the tipping point of developing and continue to enforce our positive school culture that we developed over the years. And I'm very proud of the partnership that I've developed with the Boys and Girls Club to provide extra extracurricular activities to our scholars on a regular basis. Um, challenges, um, being sixth grade only, I, I call ourselves the, we're like UK, we're a one and done, the, we're the Calipari school. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so it, it, that provides a challenge itself because every year I, I basically start with a new cohort. It's not like I have the same group of kids over and over again to produce and affect change within the school system. And so within one year, I, I need to take 40 feeder schools, meld them together, create a cohesive, a coherent school culture that carries through to help propel Stewart to future success. Um, uh, many of our kids, as you know, uh, we serve some of the most traumatic in um, um, zip codes that have violence, domestic violence, and things of that nature. Um, and so 80% um, of our kids when our counselors did a survey um, lack conflict resolution skills, and that's something that we have to take very seriously. And that foundational PBS work, we're going to continue next school year. Um, how do we know that we're being successful despite those needs? Um, just from parent stories, um, our, our data is moving in the right direction and um, we're going to continue um, working the work. Um, to, to address, when you talk about um, with the board vision, to empower and inspire, um, next school year we're working with um, our new chief academic officer in the UK Next Generation um, Leadership Academy to implement um, some deeper learning strategies. One of the things I'm proud of is with our master schedule that we're implementing next school year, we're implementing a 20% time where when you talked about, if you're taking some of the most marginalized scholars in the district, and oftentimes, if, if, if people say, well, they're low, then they get low expectations. And we're flipping down on this head. It's about providing high expectations on a daily, consistent basis and letting them know that it's okay to love school. It's okay to have a passion. It's okay to pursue ideas and teaching them what does it mean to be a learner. And so I'm very excited about our deeper learning work. We're going to continue implementing our Chromebook initiative. and um, but be realistic and proactive in addressing um, some of our needs. Even when I just look at our data for next school year coming in, um, over 200 of kids um, have missed 10 or more days. So those are data realities that we have to address. Um, my youth service and the coordinator has already conducted about 30 home visits and mm -hmm. we're taking it very seriously. And what do I need from the board? Just continue support. I want to thank you for the board request you've already approved so far, and that's helping us um, meet the needs of our scholars. And then j please just to continue to um, work with us. Our research will tell you that it takes three to five years for systemic school reform to truly occur. And what we need is just your time, your support, but I invite you out any day if you would like to know more about what are we doing and what are we doing to meet the needs of our kids and ensure that all scholars are learning on a regular basis every day, every class period, every minute. I would love to have you out. Thank you. Okay, I just want to make it clear. 
veteran <laughs> first year, okay? <laughs> because everything she said, I'm not gonna say. <laughs> I just wanna be clear with that. My name's Laura Dalton and I'm the principal of Stewart Academy. Thank you for uh, allowing me to present in front of you tonight. Um, our first year challenge, our first year successes, uh, we opened the school with a clean, newly painted classroom, uh, thanks to the collaborative efforts of our district and our custodial group at Stewart, and we thank you for that. Uh, we introduced our teachers to great RTI work of Mike Mattis, and the teachers took it and ran with it, and so we've developed um, an amazing intervention program that meets the needs of every single learner. Um, we were successful in implementing instructional and operational systems, um, which was one of the pillars, and um, we were very successful um, with that to support the students as well as the teachers. And with support from the district, um, we experienced, um, we, were, we grew our athletic and extracurricular activities, um, and that helps us to, to promote uh, the parent and community involvement as well as the student involvement. Uh, some of the challenges that we have um, at Stewart, um, staffing a building um, year after year um, with highly qualified uh, teachers. Um, it continues to be a challenge. Uh, some of these teachers are inexperienced and um, they do not understand the population and so that's a struggle for us. So we have to continue to provide them with support and the district's been phenomenal um, with the, the human resources as well as uh, the monetary um, support. Uh, also, 60% of our learners come to our school um, behind in reading and math. They're novice and they struggle with their fa foundational skills. So those are the main challenges that, that we are working on. And then next steps, we want to collaborate and continue to collaborate with the district to deliver appropriate professional development for our teachers, especially in the area of um, cultural competen competency and um, PBIS and restorative practices, which we're scheduled to do on August 10th and 11th, and we're very excited about that. Um, we are looking for many opportunities to create parent involvement and student involvement and community involvement. We had meet and greets, and I don't know if you saw us on Twitter today, but we um, went to Shawnee Library and we had meet and greets and we had parents show up and students and that was exciting for us. Um, and then uh, definitely we wanna um, create more partnerships with Frost. Um, as you can tell, um, Ms. Stroud is a great leader and I listen to her and, and follow her every day and and um, look forward to working with her. And um, we want to continue to analyze our school data, um, behavioral, academic, and I know you know the data. Um, our, our, it, our struggle is we need to be proactive instead of reactive with our students. And we are going to um, do that by implementing the positive behavior supports, looking at the restorative practices, teaching our teachers how to be fair and equitable and um, especially helping them with cultural competency. And then I think lastly, um, the most important next step for me personally as, as the principal is to um, realize the importance of student voice and uh, teacher voice. Last year, uh, starting with the new systems, there wasn't a lot of teacher voice, there wasn't a lot of student voice, but uh, this year that is in the forefront and we've already begun with many activities um, and professional developments and um, our, our whole schedule is uh, determined by the teachers. So we're working uh, extremely hard to, to change the things that we learned from last year. So thank you very much. So my name is Debbie Powers and I'm the project coordinator that was employed to be on the campus. As you can see from the slide, we're now down to two schools because as of July 1st, Valley Prep has now phased out so all of the emphasis now is on Robert Frost Academy and on Stewart Academy. Um, as expected in the plan, Stewart Academy is expanding this year. We're adding at least 140 more students. We added a teaching team. That was expected, that was planned for with the phase out of Valley Prep. However, that requires Stewart's um, systems of support to be elastic enough to expand to accommodate a new population. Fingers crossed, our Frost population remains steady because we are full. We don't have any extra classrooms. We're we are, uh, space is all taken up at this point with classroom space. So we're hopeful that we're able to maintain the current pop, uh, student population. 
So in the first year, I felt like our main work was for both schools to become established on the campus with individual identities. It's two schools sharing a footprint. So Frost having to relocate, as Dr. Hardstern said, from down the road, essentially, to our campus. And then Stewart was spread out over two buildings, and they had to all concentrate on one side. I want to give a shout out to um, Mike Razor's group. Rob Tanner and Eric Williams were phenomenal in working to get that school ready. They were there morning, noon, and night and did a fantastic job, along with our plan operator and our custodial staff. Both schools opened, ready to go, freshly painted classrooms. We were up and running with technology, not without its glitches, but we, we have 1,250 Chromebooks thanks to your generous um, support this year. So we've already added some more access points. We feel like we're going to be able to accommodate the number, but that puts a Chromebook in the, hand, in the hands of every student in every class that's necessary. So I'm, I'm thrilled about that, and thank you for your support with that one. Um, year two, really our identity needs to switch from two individual schools to seeing the two schools as a campus and a true three-year commitment to parents and students. So we're, our plans include um, a campus-wide PTSA that's going to help both schools. We're going to start meeting as a campus leadership team to promote collaboration and um, cooperation between the two schools. Not just the leadership team, however, faculty, student, parents, we all need to be a part of identifying Stewart as a campus. And finally, what I want to do is recognize the hard work of these two amazing principals. First year principal and a principal who really had only been in priority schools um, until her relocation to Frost when Frost lost its priority status. Um, it is an honor and a privilege every day to be on that campus with them. They each bring different skills to the table. They're unique in their personalities. You, sh you can see that tonight. But it is a fabulous place to work and to learn. And I can tell you I've been involved in priority work in this district for over 10 years. And this campus is a transformed campus in a single year. So I'm really looking forward to our data showing not only trend data of good climate and culture moving forward, but also academic achievement data that is going to follow. We just need time to be able to make that happen. But I really feel confident that with the team we've put together with Dr. Hartstern, Ms. McDowell, and these two principals, that they make every decision based on what's best for students. And I'm thrilled with that. So we can entertain any questions you may have at this time. I'd also like to um, add to that, um, you know, that <coughs> I think primarily it's important to know that um, the change that this team went under in one year um, was monumental. So congratulations. I mean, the most important thing, there's a lot of passion at that table um, in, in ensuring that change. It's important to note it's a foundational year we are going to ensure the success of this initiative and make sure that we do what it takes to make it successful. I have all the confidence in the world that that will happen. Um, the, the amount of change that took place um, was incredible. And I'm sure we will see the results of that change um, and that foundation moving forward from here. And we're going to provide the support that's necessary for them to be successful. All right, Dr. Polio, thank you. Uh, first questions, uh, Member Geese, and then Member Duncan. Well, first, thank each and every one of you for coming out tonight. I'm very proud to have each of you in my district, District 4. Um, I'd like to ask a few different questions, but my first question is about the partnership um, with your school and the Boys and Girls Club. So I was wondering if you could just educate us as a board a bit more about that partnership mm -hmm. and also let us know what we can do, because I know that earlier this year I'd been meeting with Boys and Girls Club and we certainly want to make sure that Southwest Louisville, in particular your school, um, has a place for the Boys and Girls Club. Um, we have a community school through the district and through my community school coordinator, uh, Ms. Linda Harris, um, she was um, approached by the Boys and Girls Club to be a uh, site for them um, because there's not as many community centers anymore in the city of Louisville. And so knowing that our demographic has a need, um, they were trying to figure out a school to partner with to, to help support that need. And for me, um, I got behind that as a principal because when you look at research and the importance of um, students belonging to the school environment and having a sense of connectedness, one of those pieces um, to feel connected to a school environment is participating in uh, extracurricular activity. Um, a lot of what's budgeted is um, from the district is more towards sports and some academic teams. And so the Boys and Girls Club provided my school an opportunity to provide even more activities for our kids in the evening um, when homework help, cooking club, just different things to 
have the kids in a safe environment, number one, um, but at the same time knowing that they're at a school that cares for them and love them. And then at the same time, because we're on a campus, we're able to extend that partnership and we actually allow and, and um, have kids from Stewart to participate in that program as well. And so um, Boys and Girls Club provides staffing and then in kind of we provide the space and, and, and um, resources for them to use. So are there any additional resources that your school needs um, in order to foster this partnership with Boys and Girls Club? Um, at this time, we're still working on that, but we're working on presenting needs to um, the community school coordinator for the district, um, and we're going to work through district channels on that. And so we're still doing some a needs assessment right now to determine those needs. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Member Duncan. <coughs> well, again, uh, tremendous admiration for both of you. Uh, I've stopped in the school because it's on my pathway uh, going to Medora Elementary. And uh, so I stop in there uh, when I can to really uh, see the difference. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a huge transformation from what it has been. But I don't know uh, at this point, I mean, it's going to be awfully early to look at test scores and say, oh, yeah, that's, that's going to be, uh, the test scores are going to demonstrate what the, the changes. But in your, just think about it for a second. From the beginning of the year to the end of the year, what was, what do you see as the things that are improving, that are giving you uh, the feeling that what you're doing is right, uh, it, it is, is having an impact, and it is moving these kids forward? Uh, because to me, it's about growth. Uh, when they come in and when they leave you, uh, did you get a sense of some things that were we're operating better at the end of the year that you could say, wow, you know, that made a difference and, and we feel like uh, we're on our way. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I was excited about the, the, the students and the relationships that were built with the teachers. Uh, the teachers came a long way from the beginning of the year with the students and they had to, um, they met new teachers and they had to build that trust and they had to build those relationships and that took a long time. But by the end of the year, um, when we had graduation um, promotion ceremony, uh, there were kids crying, there were teachers crying, and, and they had built meaningful relationships um, with each other. And I think both the students and the teachers grew. So just the relationship building, um, to have that this first year is important. And um, that's just going to get even better. Well, thank you. And I think for me, um, As a principal conducting walkthroughs, or even when I invite out Dr. Hartstern or other district leadership to walk through the building, um, the continued um, improvement in the level of rigor with the scholars. Um, on any given day, you walk into a classroom or a building, you will see scholars doing. Um, the part of the challenge, though, is now we got to make sure we're doing at high levels. But the fact that um, that whole concept of every, 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 every scholar, every day, every period. Um, pushing instruction, having discourse, questions. Um, I think um, even other principals who um, helped assisted me with walkthroughs in my building when I invite them out for a, a, a collaboration, um, they always speak to like, wow, Faith, you know, like this, this is a new day at Frost. And um, I'm really proud of the, the scholars stepping up to the plate, um, but I'm, I'm really proud at the level of honesty and reflection that my staff has in regards to um, our scholars and the honesty that they have about what their needs are when it comes to um, understanding what does it mean to be culturally relevant. Um, I'm very proud of um, when you have kids excited about reading and they can't wait to take a book home and they want to share with you, oh my gosh, have you got the chapter four yet, Ms. Stroud? Um, to me, those are the signs because I'm a big believer that your rhetoric is be a reality. And if we expect to empower scholars, then we need to put them in situations where they can be empowered. And so um, the fact that I, s I see kids taking risks, I see kids wanting to be in leadership roles, um, I have teachers um, really digging within themselves to really think about what can I do to improve the livelihood and the performance of not just a child, but of all children. Um, I'm very excited by that.
Oh, thank you. Um, just one other question. You know, when you talk about uh, size and you're limited, you're, you are going to be uh, outgrowing this the arrangement, I, I have a feeling. Um, at, at some point, will, will it be where you begin to select the students who are there because uh, we can't just keep stuffing more kids into the building. Will there be, will, will we be considering a way for them to, to be able to uh, have more of, a, of a, a, a selection process for kids to come in? So that kind of sets an even higher standard, a higher mark for kids to aim for when they're, they're wanting to choose that school. But I mean, uh, uh, space is limited, so uh, is there a, a way that that would happen? I don't know. Um, well, we're well a revived school, so we don't have a magnet or, or a program, so we are truly a revived yeah. school. So, so I mean, I think it is uh, critical on us as we move forward in any student assignment um, discussion, which we will be having um, with committee, is that we make sure that, s that schools do not g go beyond the capacity where they can be effective. Um, and so that is very important for us to make sure that, that we make appropriate decisions so that they stay within the guidelines that were determined through this process and they can remain effective in their delivery. Um, and so we'll have to make the necessary changes to do that. Now, when we know things are going well, is when students are wanting to go um, on a regular basis um, to this campus, and we think that will happen soon. Um, so we'll have to make the appropriate adjustments to ensure that it does not go beyond capacity. Very good, and uh, uh, Debbie, mm -hmm. you had a chance to look at this close up every day. Um, I know you offer a great perspective, a very broad perspective. Um, do you think that this has been uh, the right or the best uh, program for these two uh, programs that we're putting together here? Do you think this is the best way to do this? Um, I think the plan that we put forth and the plan that we are implementing is the appropriate plan for these populations. You all were very intentional last year those four pillars, I live by them, leadership support, student support, teacher support, and systems thinking. And what I can tell you is that intentional focus from all of us at the table and Ms. McDowell and all of our support staff as well on building those systems in year one and now maturing and maintaining those systems in year two, using our data to revise when we need something. We have not been ashamed to ask and you've been very gracious through the year. You told us to come back and we have put in a couple of budget requests for things that were um, not known at the time. So I feel like you've been responsive to us and you want this campus to succeed. And from my perspective and my experience at the table, I think these four pillars will make this campus successful. I believe that in my heart or I, or I wouldn't have accepted the position. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Further questions from the board? Member Porter? Uh, just a quick compliment uh, to everyone that's working there every day and to the board that made the courage, courageous decision to do this because there was a lot of conversation about was this the correct thing to do? And um, it appears that we are on the right path. I know that uh, you're working on academics as well as everything else, but I heard you say someone has decided to come here as opposed to going to another school. So that is a compliment to what your work looks like and it's not easy work but all children deserve an opportunity to learn in an environment that is welcoming to them. And we have put extra dollars to that. I'm a firm believer that we should fund and based on population that we serve. So the question is not existent. The comment is thank you, keep up the good work, and never lose hope because the students are depending on you. So thank you for your work. Further questions? Okay, um, I'll just add my uh, thanks and appreciation for the hard work that you're doing. I know that you walked into a situation that was um, overwhelming, or could be overwhelming. There's lots of changes going on. Uh, Principal Stroud, you already had an established school, but you were changing locations, and you're coming on board as a new principal, so I know there's a lot of stuff that's um, 
that's you know what's going on and it's can be, it's just that it can be fairly overwhelming uh Ms. Powers, uh, I see here you came here without a net guard. Impressive. Um, <laughs> I was hoping you'd forget that comment. <laughs> had to mention it. <laughs> but I uh, want to appreciate you all and what you're doing. And yes, I do know that this is going to take some time. Uh, like any systemic change, it's going to take some trial and error, and you're going to have to make adjustments along the way. But I do feel that we're moving in the right direction. It seems that, you know, I know that Dr. Polio is uh, focused on uh, culture, and it seems like you all are improving culture. And then with uh, shortly after culture, I would think that academic improvement is just around the corner from that. So thank you again for being here. And yes. If I could, if I could just say one more thing, and I'll be done. Um, I would like to recognize um, Dr. Powers, Dr. Hartstern, and Ms. McDowell. Um, I call her my left brain because I'm left-handed in my right brain. But anyway, Dr. Powers has been just a phenomenal mentor to me as a first-year principal. Um, I, I, I could not do this position without her. She helps me in so many ways, it's just crazy. Uh, Dr. Hartstern, Ms. McDowell are very supportive, supportive of me always. Um, they're there um, when I need them, when I don't need them. They're always there, they're very supportive, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That concludes our second information item. Our third and final information item will be a update on improvements to human resources systems and structures. At this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Polio to introduce this item. Uh, yeah, I'd like to bring up um, Tiffany Armour, Director of Human Resources, um, to update the board on systems and structures and areas for improvement in HR. Hello, good evening. So as we get started, I first want to make sure, oh, go back. I have um, the leadership team here this evening and so I want to make sure and recognize all of them. So I want to take just a second and have Odell Henderson, our Director of Labor Management and Employee Relations to stand. Margie Eckerly, our Director of um, Administrator Recruitment and Development. Amy Green, our Director of Recruitment and Staffing. Cherie Thompson, our Coordinator Processing, and also the Welcome Center. Kristen Davis, Benefits, and the Leave Center. Did I forget anybody? No, that's every. And Jose Alfaro is here also, and we're going to talk about some exciting stuff in Puerto Rico. He's been partying there all summer, so. <laughs> 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 and bringing back lots of recruits. All right, so our HR departments are well defined. Um, and they are focused on how they can positively impact student learning. We work each day on three things, communication, collaboration, and customer service. So we're really excited about um, our online management systems. So we have a new contract with Frontline Education. A lot of these pieces aren't brand new, but everything that we are focused on right now is about working smarter and faster um, and so ASOP is our new substitute management system, so it's going to replace SmartFind, and what's great about it is that it's super smart. And so it's going to be able to call substitutes, um, it's going to talk to other systems, and it's not going to waste time. So we're going to be able to get substitutes in place faster. And so we're excited about that, and schools are going to be extremely excited about that. Our applicant tracking system, I'm going to give you some more information about that in a second. Everyone is better at utilizing that. And when we talked to you guys last year, we were just getting used to it. So implementation was hard. Um, people weren't used to it yet, and now um, we can't people sometimes keep people out of there and so that's a good thing and I'm going to talk to you too in a second about how we have our principals and our hiring agents getting in there and we're really utilizing the system to get our hiring done faster. OASIS is our employee evaluation manage management system so we are going to be putting all of our forms online so finally, we're going to move away from paper pencil evaluations. No longer is employee relations labor management going to have to process 6,000 pieces of paper. All of our um, evaluations are going to be online. So it's going to save time and it's going to be efficient. And then our professional learning, learning management system is going to replace PD Central. 
And so it's also going to be smarter um, and we're going to be able to use learning platforms better. And so we're excited about having this one umbrella for these systems and we're going to be communicating and training everyone on all of these new systems. So for strategy 3.1.3, we focus on um, continuously when we're doing our training and the leadership team is meeting those three things that are collaboration, communication, customer service, always thinking about are we being student centered? Are we being school based? Is our thinking smarter and are we going to be able to be faster? Obviously, are we being efficient and are we being effective? And so some of the things that um, through our collaboration the timeline changes that have occurred to the teacher transfer selection process window. So we were able to open the transfer window earlier this year, moving it to March and closing it sooner. So that has helped everyone in the process. Overstaff placements were all done by June this year. So that helped everyone move along faster. Those are just some of the collaborations that have occurred that have helped everyone. Communications, I can't talk enough about how the collaboration with our communications department and with the transportation department have just been outstanding um, and phenomenal and we're grateful for the social media outreach that they've assisted us with, helping with bus drivers um, and with, with just applications as a whole um, for recruitment. Our individual school postings right now um, is a big deal for both classified and certified and having our principals and hiring managers understand the applicant tra tracking system now is huge. So for certified staff, you guys know that um, we have to post certified positions for 30 days. But when we're in a crunch time, and this is true for all school districts, and it's going to impact student achievement and student learning and programming, there's the waiver process. And so we're getting better and smarter about utilizing those processes so that we can try to make certain that we have a teacher in every classroom for the first day of school. So we are getting our vacancies posted as quickly as possible. We're utilizing the applicant tracking system. We're making sure principals know how to access those applicants. We have safety nets in place there to make sure that people are screened and that principals are utilizing those processes also. But the filters are so good in the applicant tracking system that we're utilizing those as well. So we're making sure that we just have those enhanced utilizations available for everyone so that we can do everything we can to have all of those vacancies filled. Now, the bad news is we have a lot of vacancies and we don't have nearly as many applicants as we need. So we're working on that and we're strategizing some ways now and for the future that we're going to help to to address that. So some current data that we have, we have, um, as you know, part of the plan, we enhanced the Welcome Center and um, we pulled out the Processing Center and that has really helped a great deal. Um, just to give you an idea, we've had 9,346 visitors to the Welcome Center. We've done 4,327 background checks and as of Sometime last week, we had processed 10,050 actions. So that just sort of gives you an idea of the volume of what we have going on, and it's a lot. Um, from applicant tracking, you can see some of the data there for certified AppleTrack for the pool, uh, the difference between females and males. So 31% of our applicants are male and 69% are female. And by race, we have 65% of them are white and 35% are minority, so it just gives you an idea, and that's overall the applicant, certified applicant pool. All right, and then we have our ongoing collaboration. One of the things we were really excited about and we're trying to hone in on and try to come up with some other things that we can do, we had a really successful on-site, right here, uh, job fair on June 15th. We had 402 visitors to Stewart Auditorium for our, um, uh, jo last job fair. 138 of those were certified and 264 of them were classified. And so um, that day, as a matter of fact, we had seven classified instructional recommendations. So we had two departments actually set up here. They were doing interviews on the spot, ready to just hire people. Um, and we collaborated with lots of departments and they were here ready to go. 
that says 100 plus new certified teachers have signed contracts to date. It's actually 122 as of today. 25 new minority teachers. Um, I mentioned that um, Jose has been really involved in his efforts, especially with Puerto Rico. We've been collaborating with many of our principals and other administrators across the district involved in um, recruitment efforts, really thinking outside of the box, working with um, diversity also in that department, John Marshall and his shop. We've had um, 43 uh, people accept conditional offers. We have um, 35 more teachers coming from Puerto Rico. These are in areas where we're having a hard time finding teachers. So we need to keep thinking these kinds of thoughts to try to get teachers in those hard to fill areas. So um, Jose is, is a great recruiter and we're really excited about some of the ideas that he's come up with and he's doing great things, the whole team is. Um, we've had nearly 100 conditional offers of employment uh, extended to date also. And then we look here, and this is where we start to get a little worried, right? So right now in elementary schools, we have um, 33 vacancies, in high school, 46. In K-12 vacancies, so when you think about um, resource teachers and some of those ones that are not specific to an individual classroom, there are 19, and then there are 32 middle school vacancies. And so it's 130 vacancies right now. And those fluctuate from day to day. And one of the things that we always have to consider is every time, and these people are important and essential, so please don't get me wrong, but when there's an assistant principal or a counselor or something even at central office and we hire and we need to, but there's a trickle down, eventually that's gonna reach a classroom probably. So we have to remember that all of that hiring eventually could impact a classroom, and we have to be mindful of that. So development and next steps, things we're excited about and things we're continuing to work on and improve, we're just watching our data. We're looking at those systems, we're thinking about those structure, structures and how can we continue to improve. We're seeking input and feedback and partnership. Um, because we know that there are answers to some of these concerns. We know there are ways to do it better and we want to improve and we want to help schools. As I'm sitting there and we listen to three schools, the staff's all here, they're texting me with, okay, here's what we're going to do about Stewart and here's how we're going to help uh, this at Frost and okay, we're going to get on this for ESL because they think about each individual school every single day and every single night um, and how they're going to help. We have lots of great things on the horizon. We've been working really hard on the employee discipline guidelines that we're gonna be bringing to you in the employee handbook. We're excited about our expansion of the administrator screening and administrator leadership cohorts, our teacher leader leadership development, and then expansion of in-house recruitment and development of classified and minority applicants. As a matter of fact, we'll be recruiting Mr. Biggers tomorrow, so. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Uh. I, I would like to add a couple things. Um, uh, first of all, on the um, definite positive things that are going on, it's a, uh, I've noticed in just a few weeks, extremely hardworking team. Um, would like to commend HR for the effort and time they put in. This is the time of year where you will see many of them working many hours um, in very hot rooms, I understand, <laughs> here in Van Hoos right now. So I want to com commend the, the HR team for doing that. Jose carrying your luggage up the stairs in a motel in Puerto Rico, I think you did. So um, excellent team, work, hard working team. Um, also the fact that in the past two years, I think we've moved into the 21st century with Apple Track and, and how we're doing. And also real increase, I think, in responsiveness to schools. So I wanna congratulate you on that. Um, growth areas that um, Tiffany hit on in several areas, but I want to reiterate um, number one is staffing of priority schools and high need schools. We still have vacancies. It's still a struggle to not only keep them staffed, you know, I come from a school that, that's a struggle, but also to keep teachers um, in those spots so that it's not constant turnover um, in our priority schools. We're gonna have to really look at ways um, to do that. I think also with our subsystem um, and how we make sure all of our schools have enough subs. Um, one of the things we are going to reduce this year are the amount of teachers that are pulled out for 
Um, okay. Professional leave, PD, we had almost 5,500 sub days this year for teachers that were on professional leave. So obviously I want and support professional leave and under certain circumstances, but that obviously puts um, a difficulty on our schools that we've got to make sure that we don't do. Um, so we've got to work on improving that. Finally, without a doubt, minority teacher recruitment and leadership is a um, key issue. As Tiffany said, we hired 25 this year, um, but we've got to find ways to increase this where we're not just dependent upon students walking out of universities, that we have enough of those, that instead we take um, our students like Mr. Biggers. Is Mr. Biggers still here by chance? Walked out, but um, we need to identify him. Now that's not one that we will see a result next year, but we need to um, work on, recruit, provide incentives so that Mr. Biggers um, goes to school and comes back to JCPS and to have a comprehensive plan and program to make sure that's done and also recruitment with for, for leadership positions. So I think those are some important things that, that we're going to have to do. And with that, what questions do we have? Again, we'll start with uh, Member Geese and we'll go to Member Duncan afterward. Yes, to add to what Dr. Polio was saying about the student we had from Educators Rising, Mr. Uh, Biggers. Um, I'm curious if we have any sort of system where we're keeping up with students who participate in Educators Rising post-secondary. If we have a database system where we're collecting information about where these students are choosing to attend a college or university, uh, tracking to see when they'll be up for graduation and to see how many of these students do in fact end up pursuing a degree in education or a related field. Um, I believe firmly in growing our own. Uh, JCPS has a long and storied tradition in educators rising. I know that because I was in it when I was in high school, back when it was called Future Educators Association, and Amy Green was our mentor. Um, I have discussed that with a few other people. Um, I know that that information is not currently held, um, and I think that that's something that we should do. We should certainly keep track of those students and growing our own and making sure that when these students go through our program, when they return with an application in hand for JCPS, um, that that is given its due and that it is made a priority. Um, speaking for myself, I know of several uh, graduates from the class of 2010 from our Education Academy uh, who unfortunately, due to a number of reasons, were not able uh, to go through the program and despite wanting to return uh, to JCPS to teach, um, either found that by the time they were offered a position, it was six weeks into the next school year, which as a teacher, no one wants to walk in six weeks after the first day of school. That is a nightmare for any teacher. Um, or finding that the system had become so bureaucratic and bloated that it was quite frankly impossible uh, for them to do that. I know several of my peers at Bellarmine University, highly respected program, went through that in 2014 as well as several, as I said, graduates of the class of 2010 from the Education Magnet Career Academies that are ran by JCPS. So we certainly need to do a better job of that uh, from personal and uh, professional experiences that I've had as a young teacher and young board member. Um, the second thing that you've already touched on, and I already touched on it a bit as well, uh, is making sure that we have all teachers in a classroom prior to the first day of school. And I know that you've already implemented some strategies uh, that are well healed. I'd like to learn a bit more about that. And if we could add to the list, um, I'd like to see some data from August 16th, 2017 to first day of school 2016 to see how effective we are this year at making sure we fill those positions prior to the first day of school. So, so like the number of I wanted to yeah. um, address those, you know, I, I agree 100% that we need to, as I said, track our own. Now, there is no reason why we can't um, know exactly who they are, um, who graduates from one of our talent academies in education that walks out the door, um, that we say that's, that's a student out of our talent academies in education, um, and essentially make a conditional offer to them before they ever get their degree um, at that university. So sometime in their senior year, early on, we make a conditional offer before someone else gets to them. 
Secondly, I think we have to improve on, um, which I think is being done now, but continue to improve on that every single candidate um, that applies for a job here gets feedback on where they are in the process. So we will continue to work on that and make sure that that happens um, and, and we get better at that. Thanks. Member Duncan. Um, I had somebody ask me the other day and I wasn't sure of the answer uh, that I if we check um, the state records on people who have graduated with certifications uh, because so many of those graduate with certifications and then go into other areas for some reason. And uh, they, they ask if that would be a good recruiting ground for uh, people to get them, to maybe pull them back into, uh, into the system, into, into education. And uh, so I, I, will, I will throw that question to you and, and ask you, does anybody check uh, that pool of you know, where people have graduated with certifications, there is a, there is a, a place that I'm not sure all those records are kept. But you mean like just check the Education Professional Standards Board for yes. people in the state of Kentucky with teaching certificates? Yep, that's it. it um, hmm. Many of them don't show up in classrooms. They go off in different directions, but they, they did receive certifications and, and they may be people that we can attract back into our schools. And th another question that has been raised to me is what are we doing to help support our minority teachers that, that, do, that we do hire and do work with us but sometimes drift away from us for, for whatever reason? Is there a, a systematic way to support our new teachers, and uh, this person was a minority teacher, so I think that's why the, he, he had drifted away and didn't feel that he had had support. So I, I guess the question is, do we have a systematic ap approach to supporting our new teachers so that we don't lose them, they don't get overwhelmed that first year and choose to do something else? Right. So we've been taking a really hard look at our new teacher induction um, and our um, mentoring program, and we need to do a better job. Teaching gets harder and harder all the time. I say it's the hardest job in the whole wide world. Um, and so there's more that we could do, absolutely, without a doubt. I'll say this. Um, district programs for onboarding um, for um, new teachers are critical. We, I think we need to do better at making sure that a lot of times it's just as a teacher here's how you do things like email get help put in grades things like that that we can do at the district level um, usually the the most challenging part for new teachers then becomes in october november december the months that um, it's uh, you know where i like to say the rubber meets the road and it's day after day effective instruction in the classroom um, and so that is incumbent on our um, chief academic officer along with our um, achievement area assistant superintendents that they ensure that every single um, every single principal and school has an effective new teacher mentoring program in their school that is ongoing that it's not just the first two weeks in the old days as a principal new new teacher induction was two weeks now you're good to go it's not the way it should be. You know, we need to have a program where it's ongoing one year, two year, you know, even the first three years in to provide support that might be differentiated. That first year is going to be intense support, but we're still going to be with you through year two and three when the learning curve, you start to really catch up and feel comfortable doing things and providing teachers, mentor teachers to other teachers and having an ongoing program. So we have to get beyond that first two week kind of welcome to this school, here's how you do things now, good luck, sink or swim. Um, and I think that's going to be really an important part of uh, our CAO and um, assistant superintendent's and, work. And if I could add, the other thing that uh, Margie is doing in administrator recruitment and development is working with the assistant superintendents to bring back, um, for lack of a better way, is the principal school 
um, so that we're doing sessions for principals. Remember the information we've provided you guys, over 50% of our principals have less than five years of experience. So some of our new principals need support to be able to pr support our new teachers. Um, and we just need to build a stronger support system all the way around. And so we're working to do that. Okay. Very good, thank you. Other questions? Number one. Um, just a couple things. Um, we're talking <coughs> um, about HR, and so one of the issues that's clear nationwide is the shortage of bus drivers, and also I think custodians have there's an issue. So can you um, address where that fits in this? Yes. You're, so we've today. actually got a great partnership with Dr. Razor and with Randy France, and we were doing um, weekly calls and with finance um, last year for gosh, probably about uh, six months at least, every Wednesday checking in. Um, Dr. Green and uh, Randy work very closely together um, along with communications. There was a, a whole team effort on that one. Um, incentives um, working, and Cordelia could probably speak better uh, to that also, and Dr. Polio, to make sure that we continue to recruit. Um, we worked even with uh, the state to try to get our background checks through uh, more quickly so that we could get drivers through um, and get them through the screening and the training. Um, lots of efforts to try to make certain that we have uh, bus drivers. And I know Dr. Razor certainly knows the data for um, not having to drop routes. And if you want to address that also, Dr. Razor, um, we're prepared for the start of the school year and ready to go. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right now, we're setting it about the same place that we were last year as far as drivers for the first day of school. The, the one uh, unknown that we have, and, and Ms. Armour could tell you this as well, is many bus drivers that resign don't tell us that they've resigned, and we find out that they no longer work for us their first day of work. So. We, we, we built in some contingencies around that. With, with the driver incentive, we were roughly able to cut our absenteeism in half. So when we ask how the driver incentive is working, it, it, I wouldn't say it's working great, but it's working good enough that we can have school. And since the implementation of the, of the incentive program, driver routes were almost non-existent. So we would project from trending that given the number of drivers we have, and what our normal slippage is at the start of the year, that we should be able to start the year in very good shape. However, I want to make sure that I do say this for my transportation staff, who every morning is still pulling off miracles when the school day starts, that we do realize that everything isn't perfect, but we have been able to stop the bleeding. And we still have extra staff who are covering bus routes. Yes, yes, and we still, we still have people who are not bus drivers who are driving, driving buses, buses every day. That's right. Um, the other, uh, I guess, question, or just, you know, I see these board uh, meetings as kind of an ongoing conversation just about, you know, different issues today. It's about HR. Um, in my business, I have a office manager who's a millennial, so she's a young person and, um, you know, trying to learn more about management in HR, they say that millennials need pretty much constant feedback. And she asked me for constant feedback. And so I have to evaluate her at least monthly. And she wants to evaluate everybody else monthly. And so as you get older, if you're evaluated monthly, that becomes like you're in trouble. And so, you know, older people are used to being evaluated maybe once a year as an attorney. I don't think I was ever really evaluated. So it's an interesting um, change in like what the expectations are of your employees. And so I don't know, how is JCPS like adapting to this reality that millennials, you know, th that's the HR, the new HR is that you're giving them, you know, constant feedback. So imagine in operations, it's different than in teaching. And um, so how, how, is, how is that going? Let me address that okay. first if I can. I mean, um, I think positive culture in a school or any department that we have is ongoing feedback mm -hmm. to employees about the successes they are having and areas for growth. And in a positive school culture, 
um, teachers are getting, teachers specifically, but all employees are getting that feedback. Not a sheet of paper, not an evaluation, but essentially feedback on those two things, successes and areas for growth. And when you have a positive culture, you don't have teachers that are saying, well, I haven't gotten any feedback until the very end of the year. Um, it is uh, a ongoing, I wanna be better and a culture of continuous improvement. So yeah, I think we see that more in younger teachers, but I think all teachers want to hear that feedback and know um, that we're giving it to them. So positive culture is ongoing. Um, I think if it's not happening, then um, like at DOS, for instance, we would get teachers that said, I haven't gotten any feedback in four or five weeks. And so we would have to find out why not. But that is a very important part of culture and climate um, that we will be hitting is that all employees get that ongoing feedback throughout the year so that, that we can have continuous growth. Further questions? Member Cole? You uh, talked about the um, oh shoot, 132 vacant classroom positions and that's really, you know, the, well, whatever you wanna call it, it's, it's n not good. What, a challenge. Um, a challenge, yeah. Uh, you know, 22 days until school starts. So what's the, um, I guess, what are we doing to ensure that as many of those 132 positions are filled as possible and is there anything the board or anybody else, you know, uh, can do to, to support that. Go get your teaching certificates. Mm -hmm. um, no, we're recruiting um, constantly. We're um, uh, vetting applicants all the time. Uh, we're going through, we're calling, um, making sure if there's something missing in the applicant tracking principles are doing a great job of being recruiters. Um, again, Jose's efforts, uh, reaching out to universities, um, the team's just doing everything that they can to make sure that we're um, looking at everybody. And so that's where uh, we are not in a, a climate anymore where we um, can't uh, and where we can turn people away or not look at every applicant. We shouldn't be anyway, but we have to make certain that we're screening and vetting and talking to and considering everyone who applies and, and that's what we're doing. Is it more the overall number of applicants that is an issue or the quality or some combination of? We have of a decrease two? in applicants mm -hmm. overall. Mm -hmm. I think you would also see in university programs, there's a significant yeah. decrease in yes, teacher candidates in university programs. I mean, it is a stark difference. Um, so I, I can't speak to whether that's locally or nationally. Yeah, yeah, I would think it's a national problem, but um, there are definitely less candidates in the pool also. Um, and so, you know, that, that's a challenge that we will, will, will continue to struggle with. And I, um, I think one of the great things about um, your focus uh, on culture climate, uh, Dr. Polio, is that I think it, one of the reasons I would suspect, I mean, uh, there might be people here that have like hard research behind it, uh, I don't know it, is that um, teachers, or potential teachers fear a lack of support, uh, fear that, hey, you've got two weeks of training, there you go. Um, so uh, I think that gives us a great opportunity to, I guess, market, you know, JCPS to uh, potential applicants. Looking forward, I know it's probably, the 22 days probably in, in enough time to do that this year, but going forward in the next year that, um, and of course, not just market, but we need to make sure that uh, it's the reality that teacher, when you, when you become a teacher in JCPS, you are supported uh, by your principal, by your superintendent, by your area superintendent, by HR, by the board. I mean, you know, teachers, all JCPS employees are incredibly important, but at the end of the day, teachers are the ones that are in the classrooms with my kid, you know, <laughs> your kid, <laughs> other people's kids. Um, you know, there, I always, uh, just for me, uh, when I think about them, I equate them to like the pilot flying the plane. I mean, there's all kinds of people that work on an airline, but the one that I really care about is the guy <laughs> flying the plane, you know? So um, I just hope that, and I know, you know, folk, well, I suspect uh, folks on the board uh, share this sentiment that we've got to make sure that we are supporting teachers and um, getting the message out there that, um, 
if teachers aren't feeling supported, that we're going to do something about it and give them a way to voice those um, feelings of not being supported in a safe way that's not necessarily accusatory to staff or anybody else, but just like, hey, we're, we might be messing each other on communication here. <laughs> you know? um, so, um, so I think it, uh, with that focus, I think next year we'll be in a much better position. Um, well, a better position. We can't do a whole lot immediately about the lack of teacher candidates coming out of universities, but um, but I really want us to focus intentionally on that um, throughout throughout the year. I think our message clearly needs to be as we recruit forward that um, yeah, the challenges might be greater um, in some some instances, and many times the reward is greater also but that when you come to Jefferson County to teach, Jefferson County Public Schools, uh, you have everything you need to be successful, um, completely supported, and you will be compensated higher than surrounding counties. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a clear message that we have to have, um, and you will have greater reward in the work that you do with JCPS. Um, others, are before I come back to you. Member Porter, I believe you had your, wanted to make a comment next. Thank you uh, for your presentation. I have my usual number of questions, so I don't want to disappoint anybody because hiring is <laughs> extremely important. Um, <coughs> one of the things that, uh, as we talked about currently, my first question was going to be, are we staff? So the answer to that is we're not staff for the first day, but everybody's working on it. Yes, so um, that's a good answer. Keep working. And as far as Mr. Biggers, I think somebody should have followed him out with the piece of paper I for the so. conditional hiring. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good, good job. Amy got okay. it. Yay. So right. there are several on. things though that I want to say is as we talk about minority hires, um, when we look at the people that we're bringing in, are we looking at the number of people that are leaving us? Because if you hire 25 and I've lost this district has lost 75, we're truly not making a difference. And perhaps this is not a question to answer right now, but uh, as a board member, I would like for the board to see truly the data of what is absolutely happening from those coming in the door mm -hmm. and those going out of the door. Because if, again, if we're bringing in 25, but we've lost 75, we clearly are not making a difference. I have written down uh, exit interviews uh, because I don't know if we do that uh, anonymously or not anonymous, anonymously because in talking to some people that have in fact left the district, there's a reason sometimes people leave and it's because of lack of support, which we, we have mentioned, lack of people uh, helping me to be successful. We as a district need to know that because we cannot get better if we don't know better. So that's something else that I wrote down. And when we talk about minority hires, it's important for the board to, to define minorities because mm -hmm. in this world that we live in, we come in all colors. So as you prepare, prepare the data for us, I would like to know specifically, at the, I would say the board, I'm one of seven, but I think it would be helpful for the board to understand exactly what that looks like. We do not have enough teachers coming out of the universities. But we have districts that pay a whole lot less than we do. And I know somebody, because I read an article, took a bus to a state where they paid a whole lot less, and guess what? They brought a bunch of teachers back. So I would like to understand the strategies that this district is using to bring people, knowing the national information that we are not getting enough teachers from the colleges. And the whole concept of the conditional hiring, two, I think it was two years ago, we did attempt to offer conditional hiring at Kentucky State University, mm -hmm. at Hampton University. I would like to know how many of those people are act actively teaching in JCPS at this time. That's two universities that I know that we attended. Trips made, promises made, did we sign them up and are they hired? I think it's important for us to look at the progress and hiring people, although it's under HR, that's a team effort, because if I go out and trash what we're doing, then people are not going to come to us. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are lots of choices in life now for people to go to work, but we have to sell ourselves as this is the place where we want you to be. We will support you. I talked to Dr. Polio earlier today about supporting our first year 
and second year teachers so that they know we are with them all the time. So I would like to know other departments in the district that are in fact helping with recruitment and bringing people to the table. I have had an opportunity to experience some of the work from uh, the diversity, equity, and poverty, but there may be other departments, so I think it would be helpful for us to know that as well. Uh, I've talked about the exit interviews. Um, alternative certification for businesses, because some of us get older and decide, I'm not going to that job. So we need to be knocking on the door to businesses and say, we would love to have you as a teacher. And we used to be able to do that. I remember one year we got some young people from Coca-Cola in Atlanta and, and places like that. So what are we doing to reach out to businesses uh, to, to bring folks in? I talked about the exit interviews. And then, uh, Dr. Perry, this may be a question for you. Um, when I had a community conversation at Mazik several years ago, one of the parents was very concerned that we were pulling teachers out of the classroom who had in fact been promoted, but we were running a series of substitutes in that classroom. So could you talk to us about how we will manage that? Because at one point, we put a stop. Folks couldn't leave the classroom until we had a certified instructor. So I think it's important because we're depending on your leadership to tell us how we will move forward with that as we go into this school year, please. Sure, well let me, uh, and I'll answer where I think we need to go. Where, where are we on that process right now with when, it, when an administrator? So we are still currently hiring administrators. Um, we're getting close to being finished but during with During the year though when, during the school when they're year, hired. So we usually wait until there is at least um, a plan in place at the school or a teacher has been hired. Okay, thank you. Um, believe firmly that we can't leave kids um, with subs. Obviously, from my comment earlier about teachers being pulled out for professional leave, um, any time a teacher leaves the classroom for a full day, the gain that must occur must be greater than them spending that entire day with their students. And so that is a fine balance to wonder how that will occur. In the same way, uh, you know, we want to support schools. Obviously, administrators are very important and keeping people from advancing, but we can't do that unless we have a teacher in place. Um, so that's an issue that I will ensure that continues or improves. Um, uh, but we really, uh, to your point, a big issue in priority schools are teachers that leave or quit during the year. And we have to find out why, um, why that's happening. And if some people just decide it's not for them, um, but if it's happening in large numbers, we have to ask that question. And teacher turnover at schools is an important part of school culture and climate that we have to look at and monitor um, throughout this. But without a doubt, we need to keep people in the classroom until we have a replacement. Thank you. Um, before I move on to uh, Member Gies' follow-up question, I, I don't want to uh, piggyback on the um, concern expressed. Uh, just a reminder to administration and to also parents as well, uh, within the last year or two, the bo this board has implemented a policy that states pretty much, and I don't have the exact number in front of me, but if a s classroom goes without a regular teacher and it has a substitute teacher for a certain amount of time, then the parent of that, uh, of those uh, students n will be m notified that there is not a permanent uh, teacher into that classroom. So. I think that's a really important point, point that Ms. Porter uh, brings up, but I also want to reiterate that to anyone that might be listening to this at home, that how would I know about this? Well, understand the Jersey Board policy that actually states that you should be notified after a specified that's length correct. of time. So just want to throw that out there. Sure. Um, then that was prior to our new board members coming on, so I know that was for you guys' uh, one-year election. Uh, Member Gies, follow-up question, and then I have some comments. Sure. Just very briefly, and this is uh, following to Dr. Cold's comments earlier um, about support for teachers. Um, something that's also incredibly important, especially for new teachers or teachers who have um, under five years' experience, is also uh, having a teacher leader in their PLC or in their cohort uh, that they can work with and develop ideas with. Um, I know at my current place of employment, um, I'm very fortunate to work with teachers who have taught some in upwards of 20 or 30 years. And so as a, as a new young teacher, uh, that's instrumental, uh, that has been instrumental to my success in the classroom. Um, one thing that troubles me is, I'm sure everyone in the room is quite aware, especially the board, 
Uh, many of our priority schools are routinely staffed with first year teachers or teachers with less than five year experience. And I think if we take a, a long, hard look at some of the data in some of those schools, um, and the w one of the main reasons I believe why those schools are struggling is quite frankly because you have younger teachers um, who require additional help, additional support, and within their individual school, there's really no one to turn to. And the unfortunate fact is that once those teachers get that experience, oftentimes they're transferring out to another school with less need. Um, I'd like to keep that on everyone's radar and see what we can come up to to combat that issue. Okay. Um, to close out, I just have a few comments uh, regarding this. Uh, first of all, there's been lots of discussion regarding uh, lack of and shortage of uh, teacher applicants to our district. That uh, is a nationwide issue that uh, is not unique to us. Um, and it isn't just unique to teachers as well. Uh, this does follow into bus drivers as well as custodial staff and substitute teachers. The weird thing about education is that when the economy is doing good, we find it a really hard to find teachers and other staff. Uh, when the economy is tanking, then business is booming here. Um, and I think that to the better good, that the economy is great right now, but we also have a difficulty in trying to find some of these positions because of that. Um, the other thing I want to mention is, um, I'm just kind of curious if you can speak to the effect that um, some of the proposed changes or possible changes, uh, especially if a possibility of a looming legislative session regarding our pensions are concerned. I know that that seems to be influencing a lot of folks uh, to retire sooner Huge. or make some, uh, some changes. Uh, I have another question beyond that, but I wanted to know if you can follow up with that. Yeah. So um, one of the things that speaks even to Ms. Porter, so we've been sort of fine tuning. Um, we have an exit interview process. Um, we've been talking about different ways to make it less optional so that we actually get that feedback from more people. So it speaks a little bit um, to that um, because we know that some of those people <coughs> leaving are not because they're retiring. Um, and so that's the feedback we want. Uh, but to that, uh, we have a lot of people who are fearful that they are going to have their retirement impacted in some way, mainly that um, the sick leave balance is going to be impacted in some way. And so because they have their years in um, or they are of a certain age, they are deciding to retire. And because, again, being in education is really, really hard. And so they're tired and they're retiring. And we've seen, um, and I don't have the exact numbers, but I can definitely get data, um, a larger number, the trend data going up, 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 and it will go way up um, if we see some of the things that are being discussed happen over the next months or years, for sure, um, with employees classified and certified um, leave if those changes occur, and, and so it will impact us greatly. There's and no I doubt. And thank you for that. I just want to reiterate that those uh, that are kind of putting two and two and two together here at this point is that we are greatly impacted by decisions that are happening in our state capital. Mm -hmm. um, and spe specifically, we heard earlier that we we're going to have another $13 million which is going to be a possible impact to our budget. Uh, in addition to that, even the mere thought of changes happening to our pension programs, and there are changes that need to happen. I'm just not sure if it needs to happen on the end that it seems to be focused on but is also having a negative impact and effect on our, uh, on our school districts in a different way. Mm -hmm. So just want everyone to be aware of how a lot of things might seem to be disconnected, but actually un un end up having a cumulative effect on this district. Mm -hmm. The last thing I want to mention here is when we're looking, when we're looking at expanding our um, viewpoint uh, as far as potential teachers, I know that there's been some discussion, I know uh, our policy committee has been discussing this regarding um, how we deal with uh, teachers history and, re and specifically um, any types of past um, you know criminal behavior 
uh, taking into consideration how long ago that might have been, what type of behavior it was. I know that there's been a lot of discussion. I've been hearing a whole, whole lot of it and doing some research in the last six months to a year regarding criminal justice reform mm -hmm. and how some of this has an implicit bias and it, it affects certain areas uh, more uh, disproportionately than others and it's certainly, and it's specifically the African American community of which we are trying to also recruit from. Mm -hmm. um, I know that there's been some discussion regarding, you know, how do you weigh a person's past uh, history, whether that is a misdemeanor or what's considered a felony, but in some states a felony could be stealing a bike because it's over $200, so that has to be con taken into consideration, versus classroom safety. Uh, or giving someone a second chance and taking into consideration how long ago that would be versus showing an e setting an example for our students. I know that's a debate that's happening. I wanted to know if you have any thoughts regarding how this is in, uh, impacting our recruitment. Um, and, and for this, I also know that I understand that there's been some discussion about this in policy committee, there but has. just so we all know, and I'm, I wasn't in those particular uh, meetings, so I'm okay. curious to know if you can share that with the rest of the board as well. So we did have some conversations about this at the policy committee. Um, our uh, stance and what we brought forward is that we would like to be able to consider with a um, specific set of criteria that we would bring forward um, to uh, the board uh, for consideration and approval, obviously with uh, misdemeanors, but even with, um, for instance, there are sometimes um, uh, convictions that have to do with child support. And so there was no, um, criminal activity that had anything to do with violence, that had anything to do with drugs. Obviously, we wouldn't consider anything that had to do with any kind of sex of, uh, offenders, anything like that. Again, we could get into very specific um, criteria when we are looking at individual, and we get those criminal background checks that let us know. But we have people who apply for positions who have um, background checks that come back to us that have, have offenses that were 10 and 20 years ago. And they were for things that are way in their past, mistakes that they made that, again, were not of a violent nature. And were when they were 18, 19, 20 years old, and we would like to be able to consider those applicants. And we can't because of the way our current policy is written, and, and we would like that reconsidered. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions regarding this? All right, hearing no other questions, thank you very much for your time. Uh, you. That concludes uh, our informational items for the board. Now we will look at our consent calendar. There are uh, uh, no speakers. Excuse me? Uh, could oh, we have I'm a sorry? Could we have oh, a I'm so sorry, yes, receive. we do need a motion. Yeah, I think we need a motion. Do we need a motion to receive all these information items? I forget. I just one realized motion. we'll just do a one motion. Thank you very much. I totally pa passed through that. I'm so used to taking motions on action items that it was, I wasn't thinking about the informational ones. Uh, I'd like to have a motion to receive the information for all three information items. Is there a motion to receive that information? Motion made by Member Cole. Is there a second made by Member Duncan? All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Now we're moving on. Thank you, Council. Um, motion, or uh, now we're going to move on to the consent calendar. I, as I said before, there are no speakers uh, regarding that. Uh, we already have a request to pull down uh, from a board member one item, which would be item uh, 9I. Are there any other requests to pull down any other items on the consent calendar? Member Porter. Can you have to turn? Uh, pull down uh, 9U, please. 9U. Okay. Any other items? Member Geese? I believe it's item uh, 9V. 9U, 9V. Is that regarding public, speaker, public speaking? Uh, there is two items. You're talking about board policy. Uh -huh. uh, v is uh, board meeting agenda. W is public participation in open meetings. Do you mean W then? Uh, w, yes. All right, so not V? Yes, that's correct. All right, so let me strike V. So item U and item W as well as item I. Uh, any other requests to pull down any of these other items? Okay, so hearing that there are no other items, uh, what I'd like to do is vote to approve the consent agenda 
minus items I, U, and W. Is there a motion? Motion made by Member Geese. Is there a second? Second made by Member Porter. All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Now we will discuss these next items separately that were a part of the consent agenda. Uh, we will start with item I. I don't believe there's any discussion regarding this particular item, just a request to vote on it separately. Um, is there a motion to vote on item I? And let me read the what item I is so everyone is on the same page. That's the re recommendation for approval of competitive negotiations, bid tabulations, contract renewals, and amendments. Is there a motion? Motion made by uh, Chair Brady. There's no discussion. There's, there wasn't a request to discuss this item. I'm having a question, having at least an inquisitory look. Uh, there was a request to pull down this particular item and vote on it separately. We're going to be approaching each of these items that have been pulled down as separate votes. So I'm looking at item I. The request is just to pull it down as a separate vote, not to have any discussion, unless there is any discussion, which I didn't hear any. So now what I'm asking for is a motion just to, uh, to vote on item I which is this bid tabulations separately. So I made a motion as chair, second by member Kolb is uh, uh, all those are in, a, uh, in favor of, of voting on this item? All right, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five uh, yeas. Any noes? There are no noes. Any abstentions? One abstention and one member is absent. So motion passes, we are moving on to our next item, which is pulled down from our agenda calendar, um, or consent agenda, excuse me, which is item U. Item U is the recommendation for approval of renaming Western Middle School to Western Middle School 40 Arts. Member Porter pulled down this item. Member Porter? Um, Member Porter wants to recognize Principal Kimberly Rice, who's here in the room, would you please stand? And can we say thank you to uh, Principal Rice for the hard work she and her team have done. I think there was an assistant principal here. I may have lost her, but uh, okay. Would you please stand because it's important for uh, the board to know who you are. We know what you are doing, but it's important for us to see you and to tell you that when you walked into Western Middle School, the enrollment was dropping drastically. We did not have students and I think you made a comment this year that we have more students than we know what to do with. And because of that, and because the arts are important to us, we are purposely, strategically paying attention. And it's important that we name this school, Western Middle School, for the arts. And congratulations for your hard work. And that's all I wanted to say. I did not question the, this. We have all the documentation in place. But for District 1 to have an elementary arts, a middle school arts, and a high school arts, I congratulate you. And I just wanted to acknowledge you tonight in this room. So thank you. Thank you. Great job. <laughs> so is there a motion to uh, approve item U, which is a re recommendation for approval of the renaming of, and I should say, Western? Middle school to Western, uh, I want to make sure I get that right, Western Middle School for the Arts. Uh, motion made by Member Porter. Is there a second? Second made by Member Horn. All those in favor? Motion's pa motion passes unanimously. Let's hope that people get that right from now on. Moving on to our next item, and this will be the revision of board policy uh, 01.421, public participation in open meetings. This is the first reading of this board policy. Um, Member Geese brought this down, so we'll start with him. Member Geese? Sure. Um, I just wanted to pull it down to comment on it uh, just briefly. Um, since taking the oath of office on January the 10th, I believe I've made a motion at every meeting to hear from our public speakers earlier in the evening um, in an effort to better accommodate their schedules as individuals. I know today we had two students who visited us today uh, who otherwise uh, at an earlier board meeting uh, and an earlier schedule might have had to wait until it looks like tonight maybe 10 p.m. Uh, as we all know maybe 11 p.m. maybe 12 a.m. in order to make their presentations um, so I would like to commend the board in particular the policy committee and the members of the policy committee both on the board both Dr. Chris Kolb 
and uh, Ms. Linda Duncan, um, as well as all of our volunteers for coming together to create a system that is more, um, more inclusive of our community, uh, demonstrates that we care about the voices of our community members, and makes it much more easier for our community to tell us how they feel on key issues. So thank you to all of you, and I look forward to hopefully at our next meeting making this uh, the law of the land, so to speak. Okay, not to throw a wrench in anything, but that was actually item U, um, and, or V rather. And the reason I, and there, I just want to make this clarification is that item V, which we've approved, by the way, for the first reading, we're gonna, all, both this reading and uh, for the first reading, uh, now we'll come back to the board two weeks from now at our next meeting. So we give uh, the public a chance to be able to chime in on any of the policies that we're in the process of revising. Uh, so most things, unless there's an emergency, requires a first reading and then a second reading. Um, but I just wanted to just point that out just to say that the agenda item that uh, Member Geese is referring to um, does move that to after the uh, superintendent's remarks. So um, not to throw a wrench in anything, but that was item B. But I am glad that you brought down item W because I do want to discuss this particular item, and that's the specific um, uh, policy regarding member or uh, public participation in the uh, in our board meetings. Uh, I'm glad that we're officially moving the speakers, so then may, I might actually finally get used to it, uh, in our agenda. But as far as how the public actually comes before the board and discusses and signs up to speak, this uh, that's what this particular policy is uh, regarding. And um, I want to point out a couple of things. First of all, just so we're clear on this, uh, to the public and we're being very transparent is that first of all uh, one of the first uh, items in here that's going to uh, at least currently be up for revision would be that uh, community members need to sign up at least 15 minutes prior to the start of the meeting uh, current policy has you signing up until the very minute that this meeting starts we would like to give 15 minutes prior that gives us ample opportunity as well as our board secretary to be able to get those names make sure that all the information is present and uh, sends that information over here to the board so whoever's in this ch chair has uh, an idea of who's going to be participating and we're all on the same page and there's nothing that's going to be last minute about that there's also some other items as far as how that actually um, how people will sign up and it's specifically to our board secretary so again there's not multiple pathways where something can get dropped and that information gets to um, to the right person at the right time um, I also want to throw in here um, we've had uh, some meetings today is a typical meeting regarding at least as far as I'm concerned regarding public participation uh, we've had a couple of meetings in the last uh, recent past that we've had multiple speakers uh, you know 15 10 25 plus which is probably which is a new record at least for me it was 22 now we're at 25 um, I would still like for us to consider uh, putting some more parameters on the amount of speakers that we have before us uh, to be thinking about that uh, the reason I asked for that is that it allows us to better gauge our time here as a board and make sure that we're dealing with the people's business and uh, we're dealing with that first and foremost. We always want to make sure that we have a chance to uh, invite, and we en certainly encourage public participation, but I think putting some, at least a little bit of some parameters around how much time that takes up of our evening is reasonable. So I just want to put that out there for us to consider, and we can discuss further on it upon our second meeting, a reading of this. So, um, Member Porter. Just want to, um make sure that if we have a conversation about that, that if it's something that the person wants us to hear their voice, that we may need to figure out how to do that. I think there is a concern that on a couple of nights we have not started on our action items until after 9.30, which has taken us away from the public that's watching TV. But in those cases where we have multiple speakers about a specific item, maybe at that point something, there might have to be a line drawn so that we can have X number of speakers and then for those who wish to stay after. Because every voice should be heard if they want to be heard. I don't know how we'd say, we're only gonna take the first 10 or we're only gonna take the first 15. So I would like for us to think about that some more so that we're not being exclusive of people if we are in fact trying to make sure that the public has an opportunity to share 
their voice. I think that that's very important that we are, are here to hear their voice, but it's also important that we get about the business of the board so that people can s that are here are able to see that. I firmly believe that when we have teachers, students that are presenting to us that we need to have give them the opportunity to make their presentations because the next morning some of them are at work at 7 o'clock. We have gotten smarter since I've come to the board and I think that uh, um, CFO Harden can attest to the fact when we have a uh, budget or uh, taxes and we line them up, uh, sometimes 25, 40, uh, we have st had special meetings just for that prior to so that we can have those speakers. But again, they want to be heard. So um, um, I understand what you're saying. I don't know how if you say you're going to have 10 and I'm number 11, you're going to have a hard time telling me, no, you won't. So I would like for us to talk about how we will do that and not turn people away because there are issues where uh, there is passion and uh, folks want to be heard. So thank you for your comments and I would just ask that the policy committee, um, as we talk about how we will do that, that we are not trying to exclude the public, but we are about getting to the business of the board. Thank you. Very good valid points. Any further discussion before we move on? All right. So it's all food for thought. We'll think about this next time we come in for our second reading. All right. At this point, I'd like to ask for a uh, approval for um, this particular item, which is the item W of our consent calendar, revision of board policy 01.421, public participation in open meetings. Is there a motion? Motion made by Member Gee, second by Member Horn. All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Now we are moving on from the consent calendar and we are going into a tie bid. So I'm going to turn at this time to Vice Chair Wilner, who will draw for tie bids. Uh, Vice Chair Wilner, I'll let you read out the tie bid before or unless you want to rip first and then read. <laughs> Your mic's off. This is bid one uh, bid ID 7415 for plumbing supplies and equipment. And I keep thinking I'm going to get better at this. All right, Masters Supply is the winning bid. And then the second one is item numbers 4, 6, 10, and 26 on bid ID 7415 for plumbing supplies and equipment. One draw for four items. And this is Ferguson Enterprises Incorporated. All right, is there a motion to award the tie bid? Motion made by Member Horn, but second by Member Duncan. All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Now we're on to board planning calendar. Is there any discussion regarding the board planning calendar? Okay, no discussion regarding the board planning calendar. Uh, I need a vote to receive the board planning calendar. Vote, um, motion made by Member Kolb, second by Member Horn. All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Now we're on to our next item, which would normally be an executive session, but we've already had that for today. So guess what, folks? Board report. Oh, was there a board? You know what? I X out of the wrong thing. Dad! <laughs> so close. Okay, board reports. My bad. So, uh, despite my best efforts, what would you like to discuss in board reports? Uh, who would like to go first? Member Horn. posted for finance um, board advisory finance committee for the audit subcommittee and the full committee. Member Geese. Um, uh, I'd like us to see if we could get finished before 10 o'clock, so I'll be very, very brief. It'll be a personal <laughs> record since coming on the board, uh, so yay for board efficiency. Um, just a few things. Again, I want to welcome Dr. Marty Polio. Um, I can say that the meeting today has been overwhelmingly positive. It's been very well ran, um, and I appreciate very much having an active, strong voice on the board, and I appreciate your leadership very, very much. And I think I speak for all of us in the room when I say that. Um, other than that, tomorrow I'm having a wonderful meeting with the PRP Booster Club. 
uh, out of the football field. I'll be meeting with uh, PRP's principal, Principal Salyer. And as the school year starts going, we start seeing our open houses pop up. I'll be attending each and every one of District 4's open houses. See that as the perfect opportunity to get the teachers, get the administrator, get the principal, uh, get the students and everyone involved. So thank you all and appreciate it very much. Member Cole. Um, I would like to thank uh, the City of St. Matthews and especially Mayor uh, Tonini. Tomorrow I'll be attending the ribbon cutting for the new track at Wagner High School. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to actually get to cut the ribbon or not, but I hope I do. That'd be pretty <laughs> cool. Um, never done that before. Um, so, but th the City of St. Matthews uh, um, uh, came up with a substantial amount of funding for that renovation. It's going to be an awesome track at Wagner. So uh, thank you very much to the city of St. Matthews. Uh, Vice Chair Walner and Member Porter. So and Member Duncan. My report is in writing, but I do want to just draw people's attention to uh, one of the pieces I report on is the cradle to career. And so just want to bring that to board members' attention since I'm representing you on that cabinet. Um, Chair Brady has also been invited to join that cabinet. But if you have any questions about that, uh, please feel free to contact me or to send me your input um, about what's happening with the cabinet. The other thing that I'll just mention briefly, uh, it, today um, the red draft regs for charter schools to accompany Senate Bill 520, House Bill, House Bill, House Bill, House House Bill 520, 520 uh, were posted on the KDE website um, earlier this afternoon. So I uh, know we'll all want to be paying attention to those draft regs and um, weighing in. Member Porter. Just quickly wanted to uh, give a shout out to Lincoln Performing Arts School. They have been having splash parties in various parts of the city and they were at Shawnee on Saturday. So thank you to Lincoln for doing that. It was fun. It helped me know where the splash park is at Shawnee. Uh, kind of passed the time of going to splash parks, but it was uh, a great day and it was uh, very hot. So just another way that uh, Lincoln uses to dr uh, draw uh, parents and students out. And also I had an opportunity to attend a uh, youth summit at the Louisville Central Community Center uh, last week and it was uh, good always to hear student voices and they talked about uh, feeling accepted and not accepted not only at school but also at home and some of the challenges that they make and I will always bring that before this board because in a district of our size our students have challenges and it's our responsibility to recognize that to provide quality education and it could cost more for one child than it does the other but we don't have any money to take away from any child so it's really important to uh, acknowledge that the youth summit was planned by students uh, at the Louisville Youth Community uh, Louisville Central Community Center so I just wanted to give a shout out to that activity and in honor of board member Geese I'm going to be quiet now so <laughs> <laughs> because it's not 10 o'clock. So those are the two that I wanted to highlight. Thank you. Member Duncan. All right. I'll race through this. Uh, no, uh, policy committee meeting is on August 1st at 4.30. Um, we had a meeting of the Achievement Gap Task Force. And one of the things that we're going to use to help uh, focus on uh, in, in addressing the Achievement Gap is our comprehensive survey and the results on um, student engagement. Because for me, I'm seeing this more and more. I think engagement has been the biggest factor to, to um, draw kids away from their best performance. And I, uh, I can't believe after, like we said, 42 years, 29% proficient especially with our African-American population, is a result of anything but engagement. I think that's a huge part of this. But anyway, the task force is, gonna, is going to uh, use that and as a launch point for the work this year. Um, attended the uh, opening of the Okolona uh, Library, the South Central Library, Regional Library at Okolona um, on Friday. And it's a another magnificent structure um, that uh, had also a huge turnout from the Oklahoma community 
to uh, look at the library, to listen to the great speakers that we had and, and uh, welcome that into the Oklahoma community. Uh, then Saturday we stuffed backpacks at Valley High School, South, neighbor, South Jefferson Neighborhood Associate, <laughs> South Jefferson Neighborhood Place, uh, stuffed backpacks for the uh, pr um, event that's coming up on Wednesday, uh, 27th, where we serve over 100 schools in, in the distribution of uh, backpacks. And we uh, worked Saturday morning to get those ready. Uh, had huge numbers of kids involved, uh, Valley's ROTC and several uh, other organizations of students that were there to help uh, put this together. But Polly Mayer is the uh, director of South Jefferson Neighborhood Place and uh, coordinated all of this and uh, uh, Dodie Fletcher uh, was one of the sponsors of uh, the backpacks themselves coming from the Safe and Drug Free uh, Drugs Grant that she oversees. I uh, also wanted to just mention the passing of uh, principal, former principal at Fairdale High School, Marilyn Holman. Uh, Marilyn Holman was a national figure in school reform and a wonderful mentor to me and uh, had a uh, just a, a huge impact on uh, our community, Fairdale community, but not just ours. Uh, the whole areas that she served when she worked with uh, Phil Schlechty in uh, the school reform uh, program there. So just wanted to recognize the passing of one great leader, one wise woman who I uh, believe that if you change the culture in the building, then the staff will change accordingly. But she says start with the culture, set the expectations, and then then you'll get the staff that you need because the others will leave who don't believe in it. But anyway, it was, uh, I just wanted to, to note her passing. Okay, well, uh, I'm sorry to hear about the passing of that, uh, of, uh, of the, uh, the former principal from Fairdale. Uh, I'll try and be quick as well. I guess the pressure's on me. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I just want to thank my colleagues uh, a couple week or week or so last week. It was last weekend. It seems like in adjusted terms, that seems like a year ago. Uh, last weekend, uh, the members of this board, as well as Dr. Polio, uh, attended a retreat, and we had a lot of uh, good, productive conversation, and it was uh, a very, uh, I think, much needed conversation and a valuable conversation to help move the district forward. I also want to thank Jonathan Lowe for helping to coordinate that, as well as our council, uh, Frank Mellon, for being present at that, as well as some of the folks from KSBA. Um, 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 facilitating that particular conversation and so especially uh, Vice Chair Dr. Lisa Wilner for coordinating all that. Uh, she came to me and said, would you like me to coordinate this? Would you like me to take this off the place? And I was like, oh my gosh, thank you, please. So uh, I'm very appreciative of that. So thank you very much. And again, thank you to my colleagues for all the hard work and extra time that you put on and put in and you gave up your weekend for that. In addition to that, this past weekend, I also want to thank um, uh, Jefferson County Teachers Association for putting on a rally that would support uh, public education. This rally mirrored those rallies that were held nationwide in uh, a show of support for uh, public ed. Uh, I specifically want to thank a couple of my colleagues for coming out. I believe we were there at 12 noon on Saturday, when, at which time the heat index was 107. I, I kid you not on that. Uh, so, uh, Member Porter and Vice Chair Wilner uh, also attended that event, and uh, they had, they said, m lots of great stuff, much better than me, but they uh, were out there to support public education and being in the heat. Uh, I think I made the joke that, you know, there's lots of folks that were certainly could stand the heat so they can stay in the kitchen. Uh, so we do appreciate that. In addition to that, I also want to throw out a special thanks to uh, State Representatives uh, Wayne, Cantrell, and Marzian, as well as State Senator uh, McGarvey and Councilman Hollander. Uh, those were the elected officials that uh, were out there, as well as several community activists and supporters of public ed. And again, I just want to say a special thank you to all those that attended that and also spoke and uh, spent time at that rally. At that, without there being any other discussion, looking over you, all of you, okay. Hearing no other discussion, let's move on. And as I said, executive session is not needed. We've already done that. So now, believe it or not, we are on to adjournment. So how's that for your first meeting? Done here before 10. Good. So, huh? 
So the, I need a motion to adjourn. Motion's made by Member Porter. Is there a second? Second made by Member Geese. All those in favor? And we are adjourned. Thank you.